Hey everyone, Nick Engvall here. Before we get into today's episode, I want to tell you about some of the people that make the sneaker history community and this podcast possible. It's more important than ever to think about who you give your money to when you're buying clothing to go with your kicks. Our friends at Guilty Goods started their brand with a goal of giving back, especially to the communities that make sneaker culture possible. With every purchase from Guilty Goods, at least 10% of the proceeds are donated to organizations like Big Brothers and Big Sisters, the Susan G. Komen Foundation, Movement for Black Lives, and many more. You can save 30% on your order by using the code HISTORY at GuiltyGoods.us. Again, that's HISTORY at GuiltyGoods.us for 30% off, and you can feel good about your purchase knowing you're supporting a meaningful cause. Sneakers are all about presentation, and if you're like me, displaying your kicks at home or in the office is just as important as when they're on your feet. Sneaker Throne makes sneaker display cases featuring customizable LED lights, drop side cases to showcase the entire side of the shoe, not just the heel or the toe, the whole shoe. They've also got display cases for trading card collectors and hat collectors. To me, it's the perfect way to display your collection. You can save at least 10% on your Sneaker Throne order by using the code HISTORY at SneakerThrone.com. That's HISTORY at SneakerThrone.com. If you're a Patreon supporter or a member of our Discord community, you already know about Kicks with V Hot Sauce and his small batch locally sourced hot sauce. V has been one of the biggest supporters of sneaker history and the podcast since the early days. and He's currently the defending champion in our Community Trivia Nights competition. Kicks with V Hot Sauce has been a huge hit with the community. You can save 10% on your order by using the code SNEAKERHISTORY10 at KICKSWITHVHOTS.COM. That's SNEAKERHISTORY10 at KICKSWITHVHOTS.COM. Now, you're probably here because you like sneakers, and if you join the Discord, you know our community is about so much more than that. Whether it's the marathon-like community calls, trivia night debates, the in-person meetups, we're just sharing our favorite experiences. We found that although we have such different backgrounds, we all have some unexpected shared passions. Not only does the entire community look out for each other when it comes to releases, we're like a support group for life in general. You can join the Discord community for free by heading to the show notes of this episode. After you're done listening to this episode, tell someone you like their kicks today. You never know how far a simple compliment can take you, and we all know how good it feels to have someone show their appreciation. Now let's get into today's episode. What up, what up? Welcome to the Sneaker History Podcast. My name is Nick Engvall, and I am super stoked for today's episode. My guest and I had an incredible conversation that ranged from footwear design to current trends like the shipping challenges that brands are facing. And we talk about the path from sampling product to starting a footwear brand because my guest actually teamed up with an NBA player who recently unveiled his very own footwear brand. And we discuss a lot of other great topics as well. Before we get into the episode, though, I wanted to give a shout out to all of our Patreon supporters. Each and every one of you helped to keep this podcast going, and we wouldn't be able to do it without your support. I also want to thank everyone in our Discord community that keeps the conversations going throughout the week and shows up for trivia nights and community Zoom calls. Personally, it's one of the best things that's ever happened to me, and I'm just grateful for all of you supporting in that way. Last but not least, I want to say thank you to everyone who has taken the time to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Audible, followed us on Spotify, subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform. That minute or two that you take out of your day helps us reach new sneaker enthusiasts that we would not be able to reach otherwise. So thank you very much for taking the time to do that. Now that we're done with the business, please enjoy my conversation with designer Brett Gollett. Georgian trying to shake off Starks. Oh, what a oh, 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 oh. LeBron James with no reward for human life. Final seconds. Bryant for the win. Bang! Iverson against Gill. The crowd on its feet. Allen for the win. Yeah! The Sneaker History Podcast. What up, what up? Welcome back to the Sneaker History Podcast. My name is Nick Ingvall. I'm super stoked today to get to talk to one of my good friends in this uh, sneaker thing, this footwear industry. Brett Goloff is with me. He has been around the block a time or two and has some incredible insights. If you're not following him on Instagram, uh, it's at Goloff, G-O-L-L-I-F-F. But I'm going to let him introduce himself. He has just always been one of my favorite people to speak to in this in this whole sneaker thing and has always an interesting perspective coming at it from the design side and you know is not afraid to just be a fan of other designers and other sneakers and all that stuff too so it's one of the things i really admire about him but i'll let him tell a little bit about himself so you can kind of understand who he is brett how's it going man I'm good, man. I'm good. Thank you for having me on the show. I really, really appreciate it. It's always fun to talk with you and uh, 
get my views out in another way. Uh, but yeah, just to give a quick intro, I'm, I'm Brett Gala. If I kind of live in two different worlds of automotive design and footwear design by day, I'm a car designer and general motors manager of, of Chevrolet and Corvette and I've worked on Hummers and other various things like that. And then by night and by life to some extent is this footwear world where, uh, you know, I, that was the start of my career. It's still a part of my career. And uh, I share my views and visions because I don't know. It excites me and it gives me an extra passion. Another thing to talk about. It's helped me to connect with so many people like yourself. And uh, I just kind of keep it going. So it's, it's, it's been a good time. Awesome, man. So I guess like in terms of the footwear stuff that you've worked on, um, what are some of the things that, that you would have worked on in the early years? Um, and also one thing that I do yeah, want to get into think, and, and kind know, of lead into you, you let go of a lot of things recently that I think most people, we talked about this when we talked with Russ, you know, months back on the sneaker combos thing, but there's a lot of letting go going yeah. on in the sneaker world too. So maybe we can get into that a little bit later on, but yeah. happy to, um, you know, all right. So my, I went, I'll just give like the quick rundown. You know, I, I basically decided I wanted to get into footwear design as like a seventh grader in high school. And that was from reading Russ's, uh, 100% MJ issue from Slam and the interview with Tinker in there and, and David Bond as well. And that like, I mean, it changed my life. I didn't know that could exist as, as that time. I mean, I had always grown up drawing and painting private art lessons from the age of three and on and like was just really into it. That's all I did was draw. And still really all I do is draw. And um, I, it, 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 you know, it bridged so much of my life when I read that article. So I kind of just sought everything out from that point on. And I made my way to CCS after high school and had, had some great high school experiences too. I mean, my high school art teacher and Jeanette Meridu, like I'm from a small town in Indiana. Nobody knew like what I wanted to do. Nobody understood any of it. And uh, she would let me like create my own curriculum. She was like, all right, you want to design shoes? I'll figure out how to critique it. And like, so I would do that. I mean, I had 25 high school art credits before I graduated. And uh, then going to CCS and that was just so serendipitous because basically Day one, I, I ran into Dwayne Lawrence, who did like Wade one, Wade two, Wade three. And, you know, he became a big mentor, took me under his wing. That led to Jason Maiden, who is a man, just family at this point, just good friend and good, good uh, overall. Like if I'm ever like, we don't talk to each other every day, but we talk to each other, you know, bi-monthly at a minimum. And if I'm ever at a spot, I'm like, hey, what is your opinion on this? Like I text him and it's like, it's right there, man. Like the, you know, just this beautiful guiding light. And uh, that then led me to a few other people and other pieces that were pivotal in that moment. And uh, I ended up, you know, coming out of CCS and there was, it was an interesting time. That's basically like 07, 08 when everything went down in the financial crunch of America and I guess the globe. And uh, I took my first job at New Balance and I was in the advanced product group. And uh, it was awesome, eye-opening, very different. Uh, it was eye-opening on a personal level. Uh, it's not to critique anybody there. This is my own like issues, but like I kind of ran into a scenario of like, I am this over the top, like my whole life is based around shoes. Like that's all it is. And, uh, and like not having other people there was just weird. Like not having other people that were like that, like it just didn't relate to it. You realize that there was, and that doesn't mean that they weren't passionate. It doesn't mean it, but it just, I didn't have anybody that equivalent in the way I looked at it. I spent like four and a half years there. It was awesome. It was a great time. I learned so much. I made so many great relationships and, and gained a lot out of it. Uh, I started blogging at the same time. And uh, growing up as a kid, I was always into uh, basically automotive and footwear at the exact same time. And I never understood, like, as I got past that 100% like MJ and like the, the kicks issues and like the back section of Slam. So basically, realistically, what that says is there's like one publisher that's willing to talk about footwear in that way, right? But automotive had everything, like everything that you could come up with, yeah. right? Uh, from America to overseas to just anywhere else, they all had their own version of it. And uh, so when I was at New Balance, I was like, all right, well, I'm, my wife was in the midst of getting her master's. I was like, I have nothing to do. So I'm going to, I'm going to start blogging and, uh, 
I knew nothing about that stuff, but I basically, by the time I met you, you know, this is well after I had been doing it for, I was like, like oh, people get paid for this. <laughs> like, and like, oh, this is like a real thing. And like, and Gotti, like one of our other friends, he was like, no, you have like a following. Like you have a real following. And I was like, oh shit, like this is, this is something that I, I guess I'm doing something right. And uh, so that, that was interesting because that opened my network up. Like that, that really brought me into a new stratosphere of stuff. So I had like an opportunity, I basically in 2011 or 2010, at the end of it, I had to make three decisions. Do I go to Nike? Do I go to Adidas? Or do I go to GM? And uh, GM had sought me out because they were looking for different people. I went to it as an opportunity to learn at a bigger global scale and learn how another creative process is. Never planned it. Just kind of happened. And I've been there for, you know, 11 years since. But at the same time, I still help a lot of footwear stuff out. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff. I, I mean, I've had my hands on nearly everything in that time. So, yeah, yeah. it's been a journey. <laughs> yeah, definitely, man. Well, and it's, it's crazy, too, because I always think, you know, your story is super relevant to where I try with sneaker history to kind of find the people that are looking to, like, connect with those people with the same passion about footwear or whatever it is they're passionate about. Right. And I think that when it comes down to it, like blogging is just such a powerful tool for that. It's the same thing as like podcast now, right? The ability to mm -hmm. let someone really get to know you through your words is something that we take for granted because we're in this, you know, we're in tweets and we're in Instagram feeds and like everything is so short where like, the next generation has an even shorter attention span, but yet like the most important part is when you go past that and you have a 10 minute, a 20 minute read or an hour long listen with somebody where you can really kind of understand, Oh, these are the things that kind of make them go. And that's why I see the the things that they do. And it like connects the dots. And then next, like, like you said, it it's like, where you're reaching out to people and you've got re people reaching out to you that are like-minded have similar passions or overlaps. And next thing you know, it's like opportunity comes from those things. And it's funny cause I never really thought about that with, with your journey so much because I, you know, like I know on the, on the work side, I've known your story and I've known that you did the blogging thing for a while, but I, I never really thought about how even just like kind of layering that aspect of what work is on top of what you do for your day job or night job or whatever, how much it, it, it acts the same way as it has for me, right? Like the more I write, the more people I meet, the more opportunities come from it, yeah. the more people I can connect other people to, to just be like, Hey, talk to this person. That's the person you need to know for that specific thing. And that's what I really get a lot of, you know, just fulfilling feelings from is like being able to connect people when they're trying to do something, you know, with whatever it is that I can help them make happen. I think I found that it like, I mean, it, there was a few things like I get frustrated of like, it, well, it, well, it did a few things for me. There was a lot of arrogance tied to it uh, where I felt like everybody wants to know about this stuff. Like, why wouldn't you want to know why an outrigger is created the way it is or how fast it is? Like you, everybody loves the shoe that they bought and every person that bought this product has this want to know how it is or how it's made, which is so stupid. Like it, it does not exist. Um, so like I had this view of like, no, I have to share this with the world. This is my, my, my duty to do. Um, but what that did though was like it ignited like realistically design in general is communication. Like you're communicating an aesthetic, you're communicating a reason to the powers that be that are allowing uh, you to create the product. You're, you're communicating to them why that aesthetic needs to exist and live. I mean, that's, that's what it is. And that blogging gave me a whole nother way to figure out how to communicate. Like it really opened me up to an entire different world that was critiquing in a different way, had a different viewpoint on what they didn't give a shit. Like, to be frank, like, it's like, no, nah, I bought the shoe. Okay. Why should I like the shoe? I'm like, well, you made it to this webpage. So that's number one reason, you know, you, you like it a little bit more. Right. Uh, so being able to communicate that stuff, but then on the flip side, realizing how much of an anomaly I probably was and still am to some extent, uh, I know that there's still others like me. So giving that voice to those other people that may not 
know where to find it. It still amazes me. Like one of the first articles that I wrote for you and Russ was, uh, it was probably the second or third one. And it was basically, how do you become a designer? And I think that was like September of 12, yeah. 13. And I'm talking complex at this point. I still get kids to contact me on yep. that. So that means that like in the 10 years that I wrote that, let's just assume that everybody is like at a minimum a freshman in high school or something like that. In the 10 years that I wrote that, like the person that first contacted me is well out of college at this point, right? And like now I'm still getting kids that are finding that article and asking me where they should go and do this and how they should go and do that. It's you find the power of what that is and how it connects. And in the same way that the way I grew up and didn't have anybody else around me that had anything to compare to what I was trying to achieve and do, you had, you now, I can be that for somebody in a different way. And that's really beautiful to me. Um, Instagram and Twitter and other things have changed it in the sense of what blogging is. Um, where it's maybe it's quicker, it's easier to connect with, uh, but it's it's uh, dialogue is different on there, I guess is the best way of saying it. Um, but it, it was something that provided me with a great amount of fulfillment. I did get burned out. Uh, I think if I were to critique it, where it fell apart for me was when I got into the point where I was being seated too much, I think is the best way to say it. Um, because it's not that I didn't value being seated. It's not I didn't like it. Like, it's a really good feeling. But the weight of it. And I felt like it got to a point where I was like, fuck, I'm just writing the same thing. Like, it's it's like uh, nothing was challenging me. Most of the times, I felt that I was better when I could be selfish. Meaning that if I could sit back and take six weeks to plan out. Because, like, I was always writing, like, ten to 20,000 words. I wasn't doing these short little things. So if I could sit out and really like plan out a lot of stuff and like working with Gerald, I mean, he was super patient with me and Gerald Sullivan and stuff because I'd be like, no, I need like five months. Like I, I, yeah, you know, I was, they probably looked at me so annoying because they were just putting stuff on a calendar to fill it. Yeah, right. Yep. And, uh, and like I was, uh, I'd be like, yeah, I would hit him up like the night before. I'm like, it's not ready. I don't. And the, and the thing that like the, the best part that I have is this was never my income. Yeah. And I never planned for it to be a part of my income. If I got 50 bucks for it, okay, cool. But it wasn't like how I was surviving. So I did not care if I hurt somebody's timeline. If it wasn't ready for me, I wasn't putting it out. But my point was, is that when it got to the point of where, you know, you're getting kind of like two or three shoes a week. And it, I kind of just quickly realized, I'm like, oh, man, this is becoming a commodity. This isn't about, like, the message anymore. And uh, I just kind of let it go. I'll still write every once in a while. I, I contacted a few people this past weekend about some pieces that, I, that I, I'm intrigued to write, like stuff that, like, challenges me and makes me think differently. But overall, that's kind of where that stuff slowed down for me. Yeah, to I, I totally relate, though. I mean, it, it's... It's one of those things where, you know, I think in, you know, you mentioned Russ and, and reading Russ's stuff for so long, you, you, you can totally understand where he's at with, you know, the frustration of all of it because it became something that mm -hmm. was so, you know, just pure, it just, it's, it, yeah, it's just, it's missing so much. And I think that's kind of the nature of, of, you know, kind of going back, I guess, to what you're saying about New Balance, right? I ran into that same, you know, kind of feeling of like, how many of us are actually really passionate about this? And I don't mm -hmm. think that everybody in a company or on a team even has to be passionate about, you know, let's say it's sneakers. We don't all have to be passionate about sneakers, you know, but everybody has to be passionate en enough about something that is you know, easily connected to that, right? If you're, if you're passionate about connecting with people, that's great for any product, right? You can work on any product right. that you enjoy if you're passionate about connecting with people. But, you know, in my experience too, running into that same, same situation multiple times where it's like, it's, it's, it can be disheartening, but at the same time, it's also kind of motivation to keep, for me to keep moving and keep finding people that are still interested in things that I'm interested in, or, you know, like you're saying, like, 
you know, challenging to you and, and, you know, making you think differently and, and questioning how you've thought going into something, you know, on the outcome, because those are the things that really drive us all right. It's, you know, like mm-hmm. we have the, the thing, a shoe, a car or whatever it is that we're, that we like, and we enjoy. And then like the conversations and the things that go on around those things are the things that really like get us kind of like outside of that comfort zone. And I think that's kind of an interesting, it's interesting because I think a lot of people in the footwear experience, let's say, have had that, right? Where it's like, oh, I, I mm-hmm. got this job at a brand or a, a retailer or a, you know, a design firm or whatever. And there's only one or two people, let's say. And, and you know, to your point, going back, it's like less and less the further back you go, right? It's like, it's people that looked at this as a job. More of it now. Yeah. And, and now definitely you'll, you'll have more people that are passionate about it, but also at the same time, that kind of can be challenging because you have more people hitting the wall and running to another company to say like, okay. Yeah. I, I think it, it's interesting. I think there's, there's more of it now, but it's not in the right way. Like I actually think of it, it's, it's pop music now where it's like, that's interesting. You, you well, I know I'm supposed to like sneakers. That's every, every kid sells on StockX. I'm supposed to. Well, why do you like it? Well, that's what we do. But why do you like it? Well, I follow it. It's, there's <laughs> a TikTok on it. So obviously it's really important to me. But why? Like I actually had that conversation with Tinker like a couple of years back where it's like they were having a hard time with people coming into the brand that knew nothing about sports or the brand in general. Yeah. And like I, you, you're seeing that. And that's fine. I mean, it's pop music. That's where it's at. I tend to look at a few things where like, I, you know, like I over read Michael Jordan into my life in too many different ways. But one of them was like, honestly, his failure of being an exec at the Wizards. And he was still too close to the game uh, where it was like, yeah, you could go play 24 minutes. Right. Or, you know, you could still lace it up and average 24 points, but you're probably going to need about 60 shots to do it. And he did it because he thought he could do better. He could teach everybody else how they're supposed to be playing the game. Right. And what I realized is that, like, that level of passion is innate to him. So he's in the top 330 basketball players in the world. And that level of passion is so innate that even people that have made it that far that are considered to be only basketball players, there's still people on that court that don't have that level of passion. So as I sat in like boardrooms and still now, like even as I talk about shoes with other people or I talk about other products, like... What drives me doesn't always drive them, but what makes me a success now is being willing to accept that. And what you have to do is probably find a way to get them to take some of your passion and enable themselves with it. Because it's probably what your actual gift is, but if you just keep it like internally to yourself and that's what drives you, it will drive you crazy because you can't find that person to relate to. You can't find that human being that like views even anything remotely in the same way. And it's like when you start taking that and enabling other people, even if it's 10%, that's when it becomes better. But to state what you're saying about other footwear pieces, no, I haven't found that. They tend to all congregate in one area in Beaverton. And it's like, and even then you can see where it becomes a challenge because, you know, they're now fighting algorithms and, and board members. It's just, it's not the same thing. Yeah. So yeah. It, it it's interesting. It makes me think of, uh, you know, when, when the pandemic kind of hit and like my, I don't like the word consulting, but it's like, that's what I do. Right. And yeah. so like in my consulting work, almost all of it went away because as somebody who's not, an actual employee, you're the most disposable thing, right? Like it's easy to end a contract and that's the blessing and the curse of, of working remote, you know, working as a contractor, a consultant remotely, especially because out of sight, out of mind, you know, it's not like they're going to see me walk into the office and they've got to cut things off face to face because, you know, like nobody wants to do that. Even, even in the times that I've had to do those things when I had an actual, you know, full-time gig somewhere, it's a terrible, nobody wants to do that. But at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, not even at the beginning, like a few months into the pandemic, as I was like trying to figure out, okay, like, do I keep going down this, like this path of like not being fully involved in a company where I have the freedom to, you know, work with anybody at any moment, or do I go back to having a full-time role again? 
so I applied for a few different roles with various companies and I won't, I don't want to put anybody on blast, but like I had an interview with a company where, you know, it's, it's over zoom calls. So it's, it's awkward to begin with because that was, you know, like we talked about before we started recording it, you know, a lot of company culture is just not supportive of that. And like, there's a lot of people that are just not comfortable with it. So it was like, it was one of those, uh, it's almost like comedic in a sense now, because I look back and it's like, the person got on the, got on the call with me and then realized that they hadn't changed their zoom background from their regular <laughs> office to this sneaker wall thing, because it was a sneaker based and not, it was a sneaker. It was a very sneaker heavy position at a big company. Right. And like right, right. that in itself to me was like a huge red flag of like, you're talking to me and thinking that I care what's behind you is going to be any way influential to my decision to work for you or with you or whatever that is. But like the fact yeah. that it happened and was like, it was like, I was like, just kind of, it stuck in my mind so much afterwards. It was like, wow, that's kind of like, it was kind of like, you know, dodge the bullet there. Right. Because that's kind of the mentality that we're talking about, about, you know, big corporations and big businesses where you just, you have a bunch of people that think, Oh, I've got to be a certain way to talk to a sneakerhead or whatever that is, you know? And like, that's not it. Right. Like it's always about the people, even if it's the shoes, it's about the people, you know, like we wouldn't care about Jordans if it wasn't for what Mike did in them and, and what he said and, and how he walked around right. and you know, how he walked from the, from the stadium to his Ferrari, you know, like all those things have an impact on, at least for me wanting to wear a pair of Jordans, you know? And it's funny to, yeah. to see like it become such a commodity and such a big deal, but still have people that, think that it's like, you know, you don't want somebody that doesn't understand the nuances of these positions, right? Like if you, right. if you don't have, if you have a, a person that's into sneakers and that's what they really want to be about, well then generally speaking, they're probably not going to be like a CEO of a company that does, you know, fitness gear and apparel and, you know, bags and accessories. It's like, that's that's a, a like it's a very nuanced passion that you're trying to like pin on someone even in that conversation to hire somebody to do something sneakers and it's funny to that we still are in this place even though it's like you were saying it's like people just do this because it's the thing to do and they like sneakers because it's the thing to do and they you know mm -hmm. you have a stock x and a goat and an ebay because it's sneakers and a thing to do I find it interesting because I think uh, a lot of uh, some scenarios I've been in, whether it's it's footwear or automotive, that it's my passion that can also be my deterrent that, that keeps me from succeeding because it intimidates the others because they can't relate to it. Like, and, and then you become known as the guy that dominates like a conversation or the person that uh, drives for things too hard. And it's like, well... No, maybe you just don't align with what actually needs to be happening. Like, I, I can confidently say that's what's kept me out of a, a few places uh, in the past of working with them is that you know, we just don't align. And that's okay. Yeah. Yep. All right. It's it's totally cool. If you want to be passive and, you know, make passive product, have at it. Like, but it's it's just, it's one of those deals where it's like, and I'll be curious because we, we do live in a cultural sensitive society more so than ever. And some for good reason, absolutely needed to be. But on the flip side, it's like having an opinion anymore is an interesting statement of how you view something and how you want to communicate it and how you do it. There's, there's ways to still have a very good opinion and still be empathetic and sympathetic for the people that are around it. But I worry that we're now at a state where it's like you don't share a view or an opinion because you're worried about how it's going to go. And at the end of the day, you're creating a product. You're, you're saying you have an opinion for why something needs to exist. So if you can't share a view on what that is, then how do you navigate? How do you course correct? How do you make these things proper? You're probably muddling the world at a time where there's too many products on the planet that were really, literally killing the planet because of it. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah well, so that, that kind of leads me into one of the things I wanted to talk about with you is, is, uh, you know, your navigation of the comments on your Instagram page, when you post things that are, 
you know, not the cool thing that everybody's buying and selling on the secondary market. Right. Because right. I, I think there's, you know, and this is not to, to, you know, discredit anybody else, but there's still a very small amount of people that can look at a product footwear specifically and be just, you know, just like infatuated to understand it even more. Right. And, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, whether, whether people understand that or not, like there's such a, there's such a, you know, I, I don't know, it sounds weird, but like, there's such a small amount of people that I think I could get on the phone with or hop on a zoom call with like this, or, you know, and literally speak for hours upon hours upon hours, because we understand where each other are coming from, even when we have a negative or, or, you know, or yeah. a questionable feeling about a particular product or, you know, design or way a company works or any of those things. But specifically, obviously the, the shoe that came to mind, but you've been doing this for years where like you see something and you're like, okay, this is, this is a game changing thing, whatever that is. And coming from it, from a design perspective is completely different from the average consumer. That's like, Oh, Travis Scott didn't wear that. So I don't need to know about it. And that's nothing against Travis Scott. I love the guy's music, but you also kind of, I guess, take extra steps for people in those comments on your page that I, a lot of people definitely don't. And, you know, the, you, I have a question about Travis Scott real quick. Uh, do, do you, do you feel like, cause Travis like push, pushes like music boundaries, right? Yeah. Like he kind of, in his production, like all that pieces. Do you think that like correlates with a Jordan one? Like is a Jordan one really pushing any boundaries? I, you know what I mean? It's like, I don't think, I don't think there's a correlation there, but I agree. Like that's, what's interesting about what you were saying about the, the ex expected sneakerhead experience now. Right. Wait, wait, hold up. I'm using my Zach Morris powers here to call a timeout and tell you about a couple of our partners. These are some of the folks that help us keep the podcast going, and they have some exclusive discounts just for our listeners. Now, if you're already subscribed to our YouTube channel, you know how I love to display my kicks when I'm not rocking them. Sneaker Throne makes sneaker display cases featuring customizable LED lights and drop side cases to showcase the entire side of your shoe, not just the heel or the toe. To me, it's the perfect way to display your collection. You can save 10% on your Sneaker Throne order by using the code HISTORY at SneakerThrone.com. That's HISTORY at SneakerThrone.com. Now, if you're a Patreon supporter or a member of our Discord community, you already know about Kicks with V Hot Sauce and his small batch locally sourced hot sauce. V has been one of the biggest supporters of a sneaker history community and the podcast since the early days. His hot sauce has been a huge hit within the community. To celebrate the launch of his new coffee habanero flavor hot sauce and my personal favorite, his new habanero honey, he's given an exclusive discount to our podcast listeners. You can save 10% by using the code sneakerhistory10 at kickswithvhots.com. That's Sneaker History 10 at kickswithvhots.com. If you're interested in sponsoring the podcast or becoming a partner with our community, get in touch with us. You can reach us by email at podcast at sneakerhistory.com. Or better yet, tell some of your favorite brands they should be sponsoring the podcast. All right, let's get back into today's episode. Because yeah. I do think that he is aware of it, right? And like, you know, and not, age has nothing to do with it, but he is definitely had a lot of crazy experiences in a very compact amount of time. You know, he's 24, 25 yeah. years old and he's had access to things that most people will never have access to. And I think he probably understands the same nuance that you just mentioned about the kid feeling like they have to be a part of it, which if mm -hmm. you're trying to set yourself up and your family for the next couple hundred years, Maybe that is where you step it back and say, well, it's safer to do a Jordan one or a trainer one or an Air Max one. And I know yeah. I'm going to get these royalties out of this or whatever, you know, whatever the deal is, I'm going to make my money here, but I can still be experimental on the music because the kids are really, I don't, I should stop saying kids because like I'm 42 years old and I'm listening to him on a regular basis, but like he is absolutely experimental with his music, right? Like I think that's what drew me yeah. into him. Yeah. He's, there's catchy stuff. There's things that I just really like. His energy is absolutely insane, but I definitely don't relate to the products that he sells the way that I think 
someone that's 22 or 23 years old does. But I still love his music. I think, I think we, 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 I'm, we're going to tie all of this together <laughs> here. Uh, I think we have our next hour laid out just off of that. Yeah. But you know, you were leading to the comments and you were leading to essentially the, the easy foam runner uh, uh, spot, right? So I think the last time, well, I guess it's three times ago, we had the media one, you know, with, with, with Russ and Gotti and Ian and, and, uh, and Alex and stuff. Previous to that, we had the Kobe one. And then previous to that, we had one where we just talked design. And you asked me within that of if I were to design shoes, like what it would be. And the obvious answer was a Jordan. Like it's, you know, it's my whole kind of life and world and like everything else. Right. So it, it's, it's, it surrounds me at all times. That's the obvious answer. There's the excitement. But what I had told you was actually easy and because they have the most opinion on footwear. And anymore, that's what I look for. And that's why I kind of made the joke about Travis because I felt like it segued yep. here where it's like, good job, you reversed a swoosh. Like, and the color blocking is based off of other color, color blockings that you've been uh, basically, you know, brainwashed to love. We all love the Fragment Jordan 1. The Fragment Jordan 1 is incredible. It's, it's Hiroshi Fudra. Nobody knows anything about him, but it's, it's perfect because there's 3,000 pairs of them. So you have to love that Royal Blue Chicago Jordan 1 version, right? I mean, it's, it's the perfect Air Jordan ever. Better get it signed by him when you see him. But uh, anyway, uh, so, you know, everybody run and grab that one. At least when you get a brown one, you know that's Travis's, like, actual view on things. But anyway, uh, I, I, I love the Jordan brand. They're so near and dear to my heart. I critique the shit out of them solely just because I'm just not – understanding where it is anymore because what we grew up on and loving was risk-taking was this understanding of been there done that take me further now we can't get a new air jordan without it tying back to the shoe that was 30 years previous to it which is just asinine to me that design team has to be so bored like yep. but anyway I, I i can't control any of that but when i look at the easy products like those guys, for the most part, are taking, like, known footwear manufacturing and just pushing it to new levels. And so the Foam Runner was, or, uh, yeah, I believe they're calling it the Foam Runner or whatever it is. This guy. Like, they're, they're, I saw it and I was like, oh, like, okay, I have to get this because I have to understand how it's made. Like, at a minimum, this, like, deep of a draw within a mold is not something that's very easy to do. Uh, knowing that this was like clearly knit, wanted to understand like how this felt. So I don't know what the amount of uh, pairs are in the world, but from what I've been told, it's somewhere between 2,000 and 3,000. Like it's very low amount of what this is. So assuming that most people that are going to hear this and watch it, they probably haven't touched it. But basically, very soft, very plush around the collar. Then it transforms to a very, very uh, durable, I guess is the best way of saying it. I don't know if it's waxed or what it is, but it is a more durable knit that goes around in the yellow. That at a minimum is pretty unique because you're changing yarns. But then what I always saw it as was essentially like a bag that somehow is wrapped around an internal midsole and... I had to like get it. Like I had to have it. I had to understand what it was. And it's probably hard to show on the camera, but if you look inside this, the amount of seams that are happening on the inside shows you like how much like form and other pieces that are going into it. I mean, like they've, they've done something very original. You don't have to like the aesthetic. Take the aesthetic out of it. I did not buy this for how it looks. I bought this to understand how it was made. That doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to get too far ahead, but the other shoe I'll bring up is probably the Kobe 2 that I just bought, the Adidas Kobe 2. But, like, you have to have more people that are questioning how things are done and questioning how they can change to do something original. That's not happening in footwear right now. And that's predominantly... Not to blame Nike, not to blame Jordan, not to blame Adidas or Puma or anybody else. That's the consumer. 
that was probably one piece that like really turned me off from the complex experience. Complex and writing was phenomenal because the group was great. All of us, our email chains were some of my favorite footwear email chains that I ever had. Uh, us all talking was amazing. The reach that you had was extraordinary. God, did we get in my view? This is me critiquing it. And I know that I'm a niche within a niche within a niche. There were so many uneducated like comments where it was just like, it helped me to realize that people don't look at it the way I look at it. And some people are just buying a shoe and that's okay. Right? Like we need them. Like that is okay. You can just buy a shoe and be content. You don't need to look past it. I know my son's that way. Like my son doesn't, you know, he's seven, so he doesn't have the depth of it. But I know he's never like he'll he'll entertain the conversations when we get older just because he loves me. But the reality is he's like, Oh yeah, that's cool. I'm gonna go play in the mud. Like it's nothing more. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Like and but my statement to it is is like we need more people that are looking past what that stuff is like travis let's just put travis in the long line of nike collaborators right you got travis you obviously have drake now who has no vision in general uh but you you have him you have the kanye obviously um john elliott jerry lorenzo you got virgil right in the middle of it you have don c pick pick all these other people that have done it kim jones uh let's see here mark newson to me is actually the best one that's done anything with him because he does challenge it and he does try to do things new but my statement is is like nike gives those dudes the blueprints like at some point Travis has to do his own thing. Like he has to because he's going to reach his growth. Like there's only so many shoes he can redo. Yep. There's only so many things he's in love with. So it's like you know it's coming. So hopefully when they're training and properly they have a vision because I think some of the most beautifully constructed shoes are from those people that have left and went and done stuff lately. So Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I, and I think – and, you know, just to play devil's advocate because I, I definitely am not the consumer that's buying a Travis Scott shoe. I mean – not only do I not care about the retro product that he's spinning, I don't like brown shoes, clothes, whatever. Like a brown is like one of my least favorite colors. So I have no skin in the game in that sense. Last, Nick, like, I feel like you need a nice fall shoe. <laughs> it really it comes in well. <laughs> I, I I I have like no skin in the game in in that sense, right? But one of the things I've been thinking about recently, and and I'm actually kind of glad we got to Travis Scott somehow because I haven't had this conversation with anyone. But because he is so much younger in his experience and especially in footwear, right? Kanye was already, you know, 10 years, 12 years beyond him and probably four or five years worth of, you know, trying to make things happen with the brand samples here, samples there, working with designers on this and that and the other. And I think that my, my hope is that Travis really is like, you know, is just, this sounds really bad. Cause I don't mean this to like, yeah. but he's, I hope he's just there for the money. Right. Like I hope he's just there and I hope that he's rehashing retro product yeah, because he's, need. because he's going to pile up money and, and go do the design stuff that he wants to do in the future. If that's what he chooses to do. Right. I don't know the guy. So I maybe think... he doesn't even care about design stuff. Maybe he's just like throw the swoosh on backwards and it's lit, you know, <laughs> like that's, <laughs> well played i think the journey is interesting because like if you think of yay like yay isn't that different than us like let's say we're all within the same age of five to eight years and what that means is like at the time of when kanye is coming into being the kanye that we all know let's just say blueprint era so let's say oh one oh two oh three jay-z era right and him becoming that the same time we're all coming up on nike talk and other various websites so my point is is like we were the small niche in the world still at that time if nike was doing a retro product it was probably fifty thousand of us buying it so that that's very small but flip the script as we just said travis is 25 so travis is roughly you know i don't know if travis is 25 but whatever his age is he's right around there let's just say he's like 11 years old when it starts getting to be the thing that takes over him it's like 2011, 2012. Like he's educated and born into this era of retro product. Yeah. 
it's fascinating because we've hit a generation of people that know the new shoe as essentially being a shoe from 1985 or a shoe from 1996 or vice versa, right? We don't have somebody that's coming in and still seeing a flight posit like Kanye saw and is still like, oh, shit, remember how that thing was done? Like, let me go rethink things, right? Yeah. We don't have that happening for people. I was able to spend some time with uh, with Devin Booker last week and actually talked with him a little bit about some of this stuff. And it's like, yeah, it's very similar to him. Like, he's, you know, he'll say it like, yeah, you're kind of put into that type of stuff. But he's lucky in the sense that the way he performed and what he came up with was the Kobe product. Yeah. And that stuff, you know, it's probably some of the best product Nike's ever made. And they've made phenomenal product year in and year out. So it's it's just fascinating because we don't, they don't have a reason to challenge the parameters of what is determined as lifestyle product. But then on the flip side, the product that is their performance product, they need to sell really well. They need it to take over. And in the basketball market, that stuff doesn't sell if it's not tied to that stuff. Yeah. But then if you go across campus and go to the running stuff, the running stuff looks like flipping UFOs right now. And you're having people beat world records. Yeah. And like with you have people that run for other companies, spray painting their stuff black and putting an A6 logo on it. Right. Like, so on the flip side, it's like, you're watching them challenge that parameter over there, but you see a whole market of people that don't want the parameters challenged. That's what I find fascinating in, in today's game. And it's like, I don't know. I have a couple pairs of the Travis Scott stuff. I usually buy stuff. I will not pay like a resale for that one. I paid resale for those Yeezys. I'll fully admit that, but I needed to have it and understand it. But like with the Travis Scott stuff, I got lucky on sneakers. It came through me and uh, I have a nice little crew of, of Gotti and, a, and two others, Omar and Jan, that, that helped me with everything. And we help each other in general. And we got lucky, just simply put. But I buy it to understand it and experience it and see what it is. You know, to note, like, well, what are you actually doing here? Um, I would argue, like, when Virgil started doing stuff, he was challenging parameters. Uh, but, like, as I look at him, his aesthetic has become the brand. Yeah. And it's like he needs to look at himself now and, like, he probably has other visions. He has other views. But he can't challenge those views because it's what people expect of him. Yeah. And it's what's going to make the product sell. Right? And it's like that's that's where – it becomes this weird commodity and it's like, where do you draw the line of, of does it need to be made and not be made at that point? Yeah. Right. How, how do you like, how, how, you know, let's say you were just thrown into that mix to say, let's break this mold, so to speak. Uh, how, how do you, how do you view that? How, how do you find the right people, you know, kind of navigate that as somebody who's, had a whole lot of experience kind of doing similar things in their day job in a sense, right? You went through some of the, yeah. the biggest changes on that side of the world, I would say, um, for the brand, but like, it's, it's almost, it's almost eerily similar in how deep rooted this is who we are. The brand mm -hmm. thought in that and with Nike, you know, like we all love it too. That's the hardest part, right? Like it's, you know, yeah. I, I still want like I still get excited over yeah, a Jordan it's our one. New Coke, right? It's yeah. like Coca Cola. What it was like, right? like that's it's, it's as American as apple pie. Yeah, point, right? exactly, like, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't know that there's a great answer to it. I mean, the reality is that at the end of the day, it's it's about opinion, and and the way I view stuff is. If you're being safe within it, you can feel it from the beginning. And I, I believe, you know, like let's use the 36 right now, the Jordan 36. It's I'm sure it's manufactured beautifully. I'm sure it's just impeccable in the way that it's made. Feels great. But that's not like there's no emotional value to it. We're lacking the emotion. If we're talking them solely, they, they have a hard time of making new stars. They have a hard time of like moving past him. Yeah. And that's okay. You know, maybe it is him though, but just make him Enzo Ferrari, right? Yeah. Like, you know, go and do that. Uh, but I, I think that to answer your question properly, I think that it's the way you approach any product. I think if I look at like the way the footwear industry, the amount of SKUs that they do every year is just such a ridiculous amount that you can't sit there and say as a business planner that every one of those is needed. 
Uh, so when that happens and you become a design team, I'm sure there's a handful of them that you're like, yeah, we do a good job on it. We put our effort into it, but we got it out the door. Uh, but on the flip side, you need to make sure that the ones that you have set the vision for the brand and have an understanding of what the brand is and where it's going to be. Uh, and I think a lot of times what happens with brand is that the way companies work, they rotate people in and out of brand. You don't have long enough to establish the brand. So by the time you get something out, new creative person comes in, boom, you start it over. Everybody has a different view, a different vision, and this is how we're going to do it. Consistency is king a lot of the times in this stuff. And I think that you need to find the right people that question it in the right way and are willing to take that task on. ACG is probably a perfect example of how Nike took something and modernized it in a unique way and has a lot of relevancy. Um, if you look at Adi, I think Adi's in a phenomenal spot with everything that you're doing. Um, the Pharrell product is gorgeous, just absolutely beautiful product. And it's curated to the market that loves it. Um, Yeezy is obviously doing everything it's meant to be uh, and pulling in people because they hit that mainstream that we've already critiqued of like, yeah, I have to have a pair of 350s. Uh, but then on the flip side, they're doing stuff that challenges the status quo. In fact, I'm looking around my office and like the three shoes that I've bought this year that have like, well, three of the four that I've, three of the five that I've bought this year that have changed the status quo, the 450, the foam runner, and now the knit runner. All of them from them, and all of them don't look like any other shoe on the planet, like at all. Um, so they're doing that well. I, I guess my statement is is to find your areas where you want to challenge the paradigm and know when it needs to be. My guess is that a lot of stuff that we're talking about and critiquing, they don't want to challenge the paradigm. They're content with what it does. And where I find the shame in that is that those were the stuff that challenged the paradigm at one point. Yeah. You know? Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, kind of, you kind of see that they're not too worried about challenging, at least with basketball, you know, in like a lot of the conversations that have been had around the, the, the consumer experience on the sneakers app recently, right? And like the, mm -hmm. the CEO coming out and saying, you know, hey, you know, I, I enjoy it when I hit on the sneakers app at, you know, or whatnot. And then them coming out and like kind of saying, well, we're working on making it better and, and blah, blah, yeah. blah. But like, they're, you know, those are things that yes, they're spoken on an internal, you know, uh, air quotes, internal meeting, but it's like a, it's an investor's meeting, right? Like that's a public call that anybody that has a Nike stock can hop on the call and listen to. And right. those, that that's very well known that like, that's going to get out to the sneakerhead community because who cares about the sneakers app other than the sneaker community, sneakerhead kind of community. And I think that's really interesting. Cause I, I do think there's some, there's some other stuff, obviously some of the stuff we want to talk about, but even just in like, yeah, I, you know, I'm a big, obviously a fan of a lot of the Reebok stuff. Right. But like mm -hmm. they are horrendous when it comes to retro product. I say that lovingly, anybody from Reebok that listens, like it, it just, it, it's like rinse and repeat for how long, like how long can you go down this path and it's, not be as successful as Jordan sure. retros, right? Like that's the problem. If it's yeah. making money for the business, then in, at least on a certain hand, you know, Jordan retro product might be funding some of the crazy stuff that happens in Nike running. I know that's a, you know, oh, a no, big that's, picture that's well said, scenario, though. right? But like yeah. Reebok, in my opinion, doesn't necessarily have that, but I think they've been doing some really weird stuff that like, is definitely not in the comfort zone in any way with some of the zig stuff that they're doing. And, and you know, the fact that I'm even yeah. saying zig 10 years after the, well, I mean, the stuff, you know, that was Mark baby and, and like some of his design stuff that he's done has just been in, in yeah. impeccable. Yeah. Like, yeah, he nailed all that. And, and, and it's wild because it's like, like they, it doesn't, it doesn't land anywhere on like, we, we've also got like the media side of it now that, almost, you know, I don't like yeah, picking on all like, these guys, but like we have friends that are at all these places and yeah. it's the same. I see literally the same photo with the same caption, you know, pasted over it with a swipe through to the rest of the photos on every major platform right now. And I follow all the major platforms. So it's like, I see it six times in my feed and we all know 
that XYZ Yeezy or Jordan is coming out. We don't need to know that, you know, Travis Scott has an Air Max one with a backwards swoosh. Like we've seen it. We've all seen it multiple times, you know, and it's like, oh, well, he wore it to like ice cream today. So we're going to see new play. pictures of it. But that's like also that's also conducive of the area that we live in or the era that we live in. Yeah. Where it's like those guys are basically like making like a great newsletter 20 years ago. And now they're like full on businesses that provides like income for many people. It's a weird thing. What? Like imagine if Nike shut the doors today. Do we have like, like can those guys withstand without them? Oh, like can, can they yeah. no? Yeah. Right. Like it's so fascinating that Nike, I mean, in, in some ways, like, I'm sorry to say this as brutal as it is. I love all of them and I'm friends with a lot of them, but it's like, you're a parasite to like the main protein yeah. piece because at the end of the day, if the protein dies, like it's gone. Like, why do I need to come to your website anymore? Yeah. And, and what's fascinating to me is that as you point out the Reebok scenario, case in point, those guys haven't had to have the conversation with Reebok because it doesn't generate anything, right? Yeah. Like at that point. My guess is, is if I were to put the Reebok stuff into context, is that there's a handful of people that's 3% of the working population there or so that truly care about like Reebok in the way that it once was. Um, and that's okay. Uh, but there's not enough people celebrating the internal voices that they've done. My experience with the footwear industry at times was that you had too many people that they were wishing Nike sales, which is an easy thing to wish for. Um, and and when I say it's an easy thing to wish for is because everybody wants that. Everybody wants that level of volume and that level of sale and that level of customer that cares for what you do. Every last person does. Uh, and sometimes I felt like that blocked uh, the stuff that I was involved with and blocked people from caring for their actual customer core. Like, well, take care of the people that you actually have, right? Like build them up and make them go further uh, and, and I think that that's, that's kind of the sad, well, that's not the sad side. It's not sad because it's the business. That's the side though, that a lot of us don't ever see. And a lot of us are so in love with what we're in love with. That becomes that driving force, like of what you, you know, what you're doing. And it's like, you know, you kind of realize that that's not the driving force for the business because it's not what's keeping the lights on. Yeah. So, yep. Well, it, it makes me think like, you know, I guess like concept kicks, right. Or, you know, one of those, like th those are the places that I like kind of always end up on for like really kind of stimulation in terms of the way people think about sneakers, because at least it's showing that there are people out there that are not just, you know, I, and I don't mean that in a, in a like demeaning way to the people that, make custom shoes, right? Like it's a craft to be able to take a shoe apart and put it together in a different way. Like I will never be able to do that no matter yeah. how hard I would try. Like, it's just not my thing. I am not that person, but like, we're also kind of, we're in this weird place, you know, like almost like layers of the awkwardness, right? Because we have now the creators that are cr creating their own products with a varied air force one, or Jordan silhouette is not, it's, it's, it seems like a money grab. Right. And that's the part that's like, I just, am like, I look at it and I'm like, you know, I don't know, like the dwell magazine keeps popping into my head. So it's like, where's the dwell magazine for sneakers. Right. Like that's what we need. It doesn't exist, yeah. man. And, and you know, uh, this sounds really demeaning. So I will state this, this is where my automotive world kicks in. That's a little bit different is that I found with like, like real people that are affording like the real, real, like car collectors, like, you know, not only do I have like a lot Ferrari, but I have like 300 other cars. We don't have as sophisticated of a crowd that buys the sneaker side of stuff. And that's not to demean anybody. But the difference is, is that for the most part, what's an expensive shoe in your head, Nick? Like, give me a price. What's the expensive shoe in your head? Yeah. Like, maybe 500 bucks. All right. Just about any one of us that are buying shoes on a regular basis, regardless to what your income level is, can figure out how to get 500 bucks for a pair of shoes. Yeah. On the flip side, as we talk about the markets, as you brought up dwell and other things like that, 
There's not many of us that can afford a $25,000 couch. Okay. There's not many of us that can afford, you know, that $100,000 watch that they only made two of. You know, and there's not many of us that can afford even the owning the five Ferraris to get on the list to be able to buy the La Ferrari. You know what yeah. I mean? So it's like we tend, and you notice it in footwear a lot. Like you notice it, especially from the high performance brands, we, they compare themselves a lot to that stuff. Inspiration wise, they draw in from a lot of those things. So we're trained to kind of pay attention to some of that stuff, but that's where the difference is. I remember when we were going from, through the financial crunch, you know, and, uh, and I was at New Balance and talking with somebody that I really respected there, been in the industry for like 20 years. You know, I'm like 22. I'm like, oh, shit, like world's falling apart. Like what's this going to be like? And he's like, ah, oh, we're going to be fine. And I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, he's like, you will find like through times like this, like people are still going to celebrate themselves every once in a while. Somebody can come up with 200 bucks to buy a pair of shoes and come up with 80 bucks. Like we're going to be fine. Don't worry about it. There's plenty of data where it proves that. And you tend to see it. I mean, it's 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 uh, it's something that gives an emotional fill that's immediate, whereas opposed to thinking about that twenty thousand dollar purchase that is a car or something for the house or something like that, that they can't do, but they can do that other thing that makes them feel good. And I think that that's something that we don't always grasp grasp like within our our area and our world of of life because we hone in so much on on other pieces that's my take yeah no i i agree definitely and i think you know it's it's uh when you when you think about it that way too like it i guess like i just like i guess like it's just you know i've i even when we don't talk for months at a time it's like i see something you'll post and i'll be like oh of course brett needs the the net runner right like and your admiration for that right is the same way that i kind of approach certain things that i've always wanted to collect right or you know like i what's a shoe like like even going back to like the the hirachi adapt right i don't need that yeah. shoe i will never like look i am like Mentally, I'm ready for Velcro Stan Smiths that I don't have to tie, <laughs> but I don't ever need an app to tie my shoes. But do I need that shoe because I'm so fascinated by it and the the people yeah. that I know that are connected to it and the journey that it's gotten, taken to get to that point? Yes, I have to have it, right? Like, of course, it's insane to think of paying $350 for a shoe or $500 for a shoe. But when that's become such a big part of your life and you want to just be like, you know, that tangible, like, okay, I need to see this in person. I need to put my foot in mm -hmm. this. I need to like, you know, bend this three, three, four ways and figure out like actually what's going on here. I think that's the interesting part of like where we're at in that, you know, and I, I wonder like too, like, are the people that are coming into the brands missing that kind of passionate curiosity that we have, and I don't mean that in a, like I'm worth, you know, older yeah. than that way. I just mean like, if you are a Travis Scott or an, the age of Travis Scott, where you came up and it was all retro product, you know, like having your own color of a retro product is, is probably a pretty cool thing to look up to, look, look forward to in life. And when do you hit that wall of like, okay. And I think it's not just a Travis Scott conversation, right? This is like a bigger thing of like, when do we, collectively as people who buy a lot of retro sneaker product hit a wall where it's like, okay, either it's, I've had enough of, you know, the frustrations with the sneakers app, or I've had enough of buying into some community or buying into some bot or buying into some resale platform where I'm just done playing that game. And I'm going to go buy something that's really just like, what the hell is that? That's what I want to buy again. Cause that's kind of what we bought sneakers for at a time, you know, in the early days, right. It was like, you know, you had a pair of Jordans on, you were the kid that people were like, what the hell is that? Like, <laughs> I think it's interesting. I think to, to, you know, you hit on a lot of part, a lot of parts, but as like people come into companies, like let's take Travis out to it because that's like a, an endorsing deal. But let's, let's talk about like a new designer starting. I think where I worry about them is, is not the, the way I look at like a career journey. When you come into like a culture, it's like a year to learn that culture it's like three years to kind of like have your effect on the culture. And then it's like four to five years to master that culture. And then it's time to like shift how you change or how you, where you maybe go to another area of it, but you got to come in and like be a student of it 
figure out how you can implement what you learned and then master it, right? And as I sit there and think of it, it's like, do they have the proper resources to challenge things? We're all surrounded by an algorithm, no matter what it is. Pick, pick whatever you're going to look at stuff. But as you like one thing, they start preloading. This is what you like. So it's like, do you have the real opportunities to break your own mold and the confidence to be able to do that as well? Because you know you're going against the grain. And will you be accepted to do that? That's kind of my fear for a lot of it. Um, you know, this year, I haven't bought a single retro product. Uh, and it wasn't necessarily on purpose, but I haven't. I have went backwards and bought, like I bought the Kobe 2. Um, but it, what's fascinating to me, and I didn't realize it until I bought it. So I got the Kobe 2 in a couple of weeks, and I'm now venturing in on like 600 likes and like comments. And for me, that's a lot. Like I usually am around 150 to 200. Uh, and but it's it's generated a lot of conversation like this year and I put up a shitty photo like just a terrible thing of like I had just gotten back from Phoenix and like I saw it and I was like oh I'm gonna throw this up and what's fascinating to me is that this shoe and I didn't realize until I grasped it or until I bought it is existing at the exact same time as this shoe and they're both molded products both entirely a molded piece where like that's the aesthetic you know that internally adidas was considering this their posit competitor but they look worlds apart yep i would argue right now if i walk into a footlocker from nike product to puma product to adidas product to even new balance product from a basketball standpoint they're all sharing a similar aesthetic that's something that is totally different where you might want it to make sure that you were competing in the same way of like, I need a zero to 60 time of three seconds, right? But you're not doing it in the same way. And that's something that has completely changed. That's where I can confidently say as a 37 year old man right now, Comparing to what I bought back then and what kids are now is there isn't a difference there. You're, you're very much trying to fight for the same thing. And that would be worrisome if I'm a CEO in any one of those places. Yeah. In my that's a good point. Or in charge of product at least. Yeah. It, 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 it's also interesting to, to, I never really thought about those two shoes being in the same, you know, obviously same year. Yeah. Literally when, the when, same year. Like, you know that it's happening, but I don't even like thinking about like probably five or I'm six years ago. I'm going to for a second thing. and grab a slam. Keep talking. Yes. But like, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting because it's, it's almost like a lot of times, like, like right now, for instance, like you said, so many people so, or so many of the brands have a very similar aesthetic and there's always this, like from a consumer side, oh, so-and-so copied so-and-so, right? And right. I'm sure there's there are always elements of that that might happen, but we're also, like you said, we're all being fed the same things by the algorithm at this point. And it, it, it made me think of like Formula One, right? These cars are built to very specific things, but they also have a lot of differences between them. And then they run, you know, 20 cars within two to three seconds of each other for an hour race or three hour race. And it's like, it's so minimal, the differences that we see but like the differences that happen and the, the, the path to get to success for a, a Red Bull team or a Mercedes team is absolutely different than the rest of the field. Right. And I think that probably happens in footwear a lot where, you know, to your point about like having, you know, Adidas or Nike be, you know, those top tier brands. And then you have like everybody else fighting for the rest of that kind of big chunk in the middle and then obviously, you know, like the brands that are just going to scoop up the $50 and under price point because they know that, hey, this is a consumer that's always going to buy these, you know, whatever shoe that's out there on the market or whatever shoe that's sitting at Kohl's on, on you know, a discount, right? Um, right. But it's really, it's really interesting to think of those two shoes. And, and I wonder, like, you know, what at that time running wise, I can't think of the shoes that were, you know kind of pushing the envelope in terms of running shoes because I think like at that time it would have been obviously Pegasus is always there. Yeah. Um, Myler, um, the other pieces, Air Max was still 
could be a running shoe at that point. Uh, you know, Air Max 01, 2000. Yeah. yeah, two near happening with Air Max 98 and stuff like that. I think the other pieces that were happening, though, would have been more of the trail boom that was going on at that time as well. Uh, but I think there was very much a delineage of product in that same. You know, as you were, like, talking, I was like, oh, like, because I saw it click with you that, you know, I pointed out that those two are from the same era. I was like, oh, well, let's just grab a slam. So let's go with slam. We were looking at May of 2000, right? I went with this one for a specific reason. Is if you were a slam follower back then, the May issue always came out in, like, March, and realistically, it was the All-Star Game breakdown. So let's look at the All-Star Game. We have Vince Carter in the Tai Chi, right? So completely original aesthetic in its own. As we flip the page, we have Iverson in what I believe is either the three or the five. I don't recall, but completely different aesthetic. You have Elton Brand wearing a Pippin two. We have Jerry Stackhouse wearing his Stackhouse three. We have Marbury wearing a Kevin Garnett shoe. Here's what's important about all of those. None of them look even remotely alike, right? Yep. Not even a single thing on that page looks like the other one. Uh, we get into Shaq as he's in his dunk.net phase. He's going with a gradient yellow and black shoe, completely original to his own aesthetic. Gradients didn't really exist back then. Yep. As we turn the page again, we have Kobe wearing an all-star version of what would be just a standard Adidas basketball shoe. But, again, doesn't look like anything else. Still doing feet you wear at that time. My point to this is, is like, you have Steve Francis doing, like, a completely welded, like, shoe yep. with, uh, you know, lines and other pieces that are gradiating and going across it. Everybody had their own original aesthetic. Like, that, that doesn't exist. Like, it doesn't. And it's like, if you turn the page and here's your flight posit one on kid in his own colorway. I mean, like... That to me is, I don't know, that's, I don't know. I don't live in that world. Like that's, that's scary to me. Like I get it if you're Nike people, yeah. like, you know, cause I just turned the page and here's a, uh, here's a young Cincinnati Bearcat, Kenyon Martin dunking in the black version of the flight posit. Yeah. Nike establishes the Nike aesthetic and sends it through them. Yeah. Adidas establishes the Adidas aesthetic and sends it through them. Puma and so on. Right. But it's like so much right now. Like there was some stuff I saw on court the other day that I was literally guessing as to like what brand it was. And it's because it's all, you know, we're all looking at the same stuff and we're all kind of doing the same thing. And it's like, you don't have enough people challenging that parameter. I think back to some of that early, like Jordan and Jumpman stuff, like when they set out, like one shoe that I'm still trying to get is the Jumpman Team J and the Jordan 3%, and they'll come up every once in a while, like, un yep. unworn and stuff like that, and someone will just want, like, $700. I'm like, this is worth... I'm the only person that knows about this shoe that's <laughs> yeah. trying to buy yeah. it. Like, sell it to me for two twenty, and I'm good. Yep. But, like, you know, you have some guy that's going to hold on to it forever, but, like, all of those shoes took, like, great risks, like, just yeah. so unique in the way that they were made. Like, it doesn't... Man, like, you will struggle to see a Jordan shoe that isn't like literally isn't a takedown of an 11, one, four or five or anything like that. And it's like that, that's where I see that this stuff has changed in a, in a way that how do you recover from it? Because the volume that they're selling can't be discarded. Like you can't, you can't just be like, well, yeah. I'm choosing not yep. to sell 3 million pairs now. Right. Because it doesn't fit with our brand identity. So it's like, how do you do it? And how do you shift it? You know, yeah. I don't have that answer. I'm not a business major. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's interesting too, because, you know, the, the risk takers are almost, they're, you know, they're almost inhibited, right? Like, from mm -hmm. actually taking risk within those lineages where, you know, yes, there was maybe a similar aesthetic between the three and the four for Jordans, sort of, but it was still a drastically different looking shoe, you know, at the end of the day. And then as you progress through the Jordan line, I mean, what made it exciting is it, it was like, what what's coming next right like you don't know mm -hmm. you almost have no clue of what's coming next and to your point about the 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 
the new stuff, it's frustrating for me. Like I love the way the 32 looks aesthetically, but it's frustrating to me that it's tied to a previous Jordan model. Like I just don't, I I want it to be the like, did the launch in Italy, right? Like, like, you know, all that says to me is like just a lack of confidence in what you're doing that you have to tie back to that because it's the only way that it's going to sell where it's like, all right, do it in Italy. Cool. Have at it. But let Tate and all those guys that are designing that stuff just run wild with it. Like, yeah. What can actually Italy enable in the product as opposed to trying to make it that way? But like, let's let's, uh, you know, as, as you were talking, some of that stuff, like what kind of like came into my mind was it's you you regardless footwear anywhere and shit starbucks mcdonald's i don't care like you have to be a brave soul to be willing to go against the the status quo like to question it in a way of why it's being done you're gonna have to be willing to fail you're gonna have to be willing to watch people question and say that you're doing things wrong and in a corporate environment man that's hard like because At the end of the day, like sometimes like what I deal with within my family is I'm flustered with various career points or other pieces. And it's not because I'm the company is bad or anything. It's it's just because I'm not where I want myself to be at times and getting other people to understand that and be like, well, you should just be grateful that you have a job. And it's like, well, yes, everybody's grateful that they have it. But sometimes like when you get into the creative field, like. It's your drive to make something different and stay and not losing that fire, like not losing it as you get older and knowing when to push something in a healthy way and and keep it going. Like we're able to critique this solely from a product. But if I'm somebody that's, you know, a designer and I'm listening to it, it could probably hurt some of the stuff that we're saying. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, and it's it's not to take away from them. It's just to hopefully and kind of encourage where it's like, find your ways to push around that stuff. And I don't know that there's been enough acceptance of that anymore in, in, in my view. Yeah, it feels like we've gotten to a point where, I mean, and even in my work, I, I think I was trying to explain this to somebody the other day. Uh, you know, the, the worst as someone who does not work directly for one company for a bulk of my income, the worst request that I can have from a potential client or a client is do what you already did. Like, well, then why are you hiring me? Yeah. Yeah. Like I don't get me wrong. Like I appreciate that you liked what I've done. I'm very appreciative of that. I'm very appreciative that we can have a conversation, but I'm even if I say yes to this because you say here's the money, I, I, I'm going to be bored with that in a very short right. amount of time. Even if it's those little things that challenge that me, you probably like delay starting. You procrastinate like super hard, yep. and then you knock it out in like twelve hours straight and just move on. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I, I guess like kind of going back to like the thought about the Jordans and the change between. So I guess. My, you know, I say it lovingly and like supportive of, you know, Jordan brand. Obviously it's so important. It doesn't, I don't exist in my, my life doesn't exist anywhere near what it does now without the, without Jordans and Nike changing everything about the way we consume footwear. But I see all the sales on the retro side and I just like inherently in my mind, I go to cool. This is going to result in people getting to take those chances in other aspects of what happens. And it doesn't seem to happen. And I, I, I know that like, we're also in another time and space when it comes to businesses and money and numbers and, and, you know, bottom line and all those things. But, you know, like if you, it's, it's crazy to me because like in footwear, even if you just backed up off of, you know, all the stuff that's going on right now and you look at like kind of the, the trend of brands that kind of lean so heavily on their legacy product, right? Mm-hmm. You know, Adidas is a great example of like, they can't possibly make enough superstars and Stan Smith's and Rod Lavers to make money the way they need to make money now versus when they were doing that in the nineties 
you know, they rehashed the Stan Smith multiple times. And, and I get like part of that is always going to be in the mix. But it was like a bread, you know, like it was a breadwinner for them for a long time to just keep with that legacy product. And then you don't get you have like a lull in the long term effects of the business, in my opinion, because you don't have that follow through on the on the on the like the risk taking product. Right. You know, like. I don't know. I'm just kind of. But I think of like there, but... what what. Let's go broader spectrum here. Like what we're critiquing a lot is. um uh, it's unique in itself that we're like as an idea of what we're talking about product sales and stuff like that. It's like 20, 40, it's like 60 years old. Right. So like the foundation of like what is meant to be this idea of brand and what we all associate with and make a part of our lives and an extension past us is a very new thing for human civilization. And the reason I bring that up is today the new The Batman trailer just came out. And if we were to go back to 2005, that's Batman Begins and Christopher Nolan rebooting it. And by 13, we've went through for arguably the three greatest Batman films ever created and arguably some of the best comic book and one of them potentially being a film that is outside the realm of just comic books, right? Just great stories, just beautifully done. And since that time, there's been four other reboots of the Batman series. And it's like, how many different ways can we come up with saying the Batman or Batman Begins or Batman? The, you know what I mean? It's like, but if I'm Warner Brothers, they're like, yeah, just reboot it. It's simple money. All of them are going to go and watch it. Get me a new dark director and let them go and do their thing. Like there's an element of when you're putting that amount of money into an investment that you're like, well, I want my return, right? I want it to come back. So I, I tend to actually think of Jordan in different ways. And I actually think, well, you were at Finish Lawn. I wrote this article for you and Edler, but it was like, why are they not just the eames of footwear? Like the reality is, is none of us really care too much about the on-court product um, from a lifestyle standpoint. And I'm sure there's basketball players that are listening to this and be like, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. That's cool. You're one of the 5% of people that buy the shoe and put it on the court. Great job. Uh, but it seems like to me, and I wrote this in the article, like I can't remember what price I chose, but right now as you know, some of these custom makers are proving that people are willing to spend $3,000 to get a Jordan one at any time in the color way that they want. The reality is, is that if I were, you know, if I could budget every year that I needed $900 to buy a black and red Jordan one, because I destroyed it in the same way that I know that I can get the exact original Eames chair that is black and walnut. And I know that I need $4,800 roughly to do that. I know I need that and I can do it. Why, why are we not setting up a business plan around that way? Because they're profiting an extreme amount. They're solving customer data and consumer likelihood of coming back. Um, if I'm somebody that can budget to say that I can get the Concord Jordan 11, right. And, and go and knock it out. And it's like, maybe you have your five to seven staple shoes, one, three, five, uh, one, three, four, five, and then throw 11 and like 13 or 14 or something like that in there. And then your hot spots of retro product, you drop in, Hey, this year we're doing the two, get it while you can, you know, yep. uh, do it that way. It seems like that's, that's an opportunity. And as we talked, you know, a little bit earlier of where you see taking that customer higher and getting that upper echelon of like disposable cash, that's where you probably see it coming into play a little bit more too. That's my opinion. I don't know, but it's just because the way you're doing it, like I know, when, oh man, what was it that came out this weekend that cracked me up? The 97s, that they announced that the 97s were coming back out. Yeah. Whereas two years ago, the silver bullet 97 was out. So I'm like, all right, I get another chance to get it, but you're going to make it slightly different. And you know, yeah. it's, it's one of those deals. You're already kind of doing it. Yep. Like, so like we're all just waiting for black and red 11 or black and red one to come again and, and some other stuff. Right. I mean, you're already doing it. Why not just do it consistently and stop having people be frustrated, which, you know, from some of the leaked data that came out this weekend, they're clearly seeing that people are willing to leave them now. Yeah. So, yeah. It, yeah. I, I, we could kind of, 
I feel like we could go on about that for quite a while, but it, it's definitely, uh, you know, to your point, right? We, we were talking about this years ago in the same sense, you know, yeah. you see various attempts at repositioning something or reinventing something as, you know, the Bin 23 series, which was phenomenal, or, you know, when they maybe did a, a lesser job of it, calling it the remastered stuff. And, you know, like some of the stuff was great. But some of the stuff was not what we would want to pay as yeah. consumers for for that product quality wise, and I think well, like, I, you I just, just read that the everything is going up another twenty dollars next year. Right and now. yeah, exactly. And that, like, I mean, and that's a, a, that's another interesting conversation too because part of that is like you can, I mean, if I'm working at Nike or any, if I'm working at any brand, I'm looking at StockX, I'm looking at Goat, and I'm looking at eBay, and I'm going, oh, people are paying this for this product. Well, obviously, well, let's make that the product. Cost wasn't, I mean, maybe there's that, but I anticipate the cost increases the global supply chain chaos that's happening right now. I mean, I can say from a, a standpoint of shipping a, a, a carton of, of footwear over on like a 20-foot container to a 40-foot container a year ago would have been like to send 3,000 shoes over would have been like – thousand bucks now it's like twenty three thousand dollars so Jesus. i mean uh yeah i mean it's, it's completely different so i'm i'm sure there's a portion of that yeah 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 you're you're probably absolutely right um so i guess like kind of leaning into that basketball conversation right basketball as a whole is not the influence on footwear that it once was but mm -hmm. do you think that do you think that something like the Yeezy brand or anybody else that's, you know, really f kind of far out there pushing the envelope, you know, like you mentioned Nike ACG and I'm saying some of the stuff that Reebok did. Can we get back to a point where that risk taking happens on the basketball court or does it ever I think does it it even make sense? I think it has to. At some point, everybody's just going to the volume is going to be so low. They're going to be willing to pivot. Um, but I don't know. I mean, this lovingly to the LeBron team, but like one of my favorite things that I read this year was uh, Gotti sent it to me because I was, we were all critiquing the crap out of Space Jam, predominantly because it wasn't Michael Jordan Space Jam. But yeah. the Onion put up like sixth grade or, or seven year old debating to go and see LeBron James' new film based off a New York Times review, right? Yeah. And like <laughs> I sit there and look at the new LeBron, and I'm like, this was built for children like just aesthetically it was it's beautiful i'm sure it's so well made i i know it's well engineered but aesthetically it's a very immature approach and the way i view it is in my view uh very in line with some of the products have become very much a character of what it is and you brought up the Yeezy stuff, you know, so Yeezy's in the midst of doing their basketball academy and they've got the two new basketball shoes that we saw and uh I was talking with a friend Omar about that and and I was in because he's kind of one of the other people that buys Yeezys with me that I'll communicate back and forth with. And the first thing I noticed right away, it's a full carbon fiber shank plate. The last basketball shoe didn't have that in it. So then I started looking further. They've come even though it aesthetically looks very similar, it's a completely different midsole unit. So my point to you is, is they're taking an aesthetic stretch, but they're actually building a performance basketball shoe, which they weren't doing before. They did not have any of that stuff in it. Uh, you know, will it take off? I think the the challenge with that is that basketball is a hard market and uh, it's tough in that sense. I would like to see more risk taking. I mean, the reality is, as you said, basketball didn't have the influence on it. It does. But the reality is the influence is in the tunnel and it's the lifestyle yeah. stuff that they're wearing. And it's like, when you look at it that way, it's still there. People are still looking to them. Why are we not putting something different on them and getting it to go further? I mean, it's like, it's a no brainer to me. It will come back in the same way that running shoes for years kind of went through. You had stuff and then boom, the moment like Nike did the, the, the sub two hour marathon stuff, you know, like that changed, that changed running forever. And the way that that is going is like, it's not slowing up. They, probably need something similar for that for a basketball product. They not just being Nike, but anybody. Yeah. It needs to be taken back to this serious level, in my opinion. 
in, in, I'm sorry to critique the LeBron stuff. I'll say the Kyrie, the KD, all that stuff. It, it's become an expression of those persons as opposed to the tool that they had. That's where we are missing a Kobe line. If I go back to where we kind of talked about something that I would truly miss, I mean, take the human factor out of it. The thing that I miss is that level of innovation that went into every year of like, I mean, it, it's making a, a, a tool for arguably one of the most detailed basketball players ever. Uh, of how they broke down function and issues and that going away that problem solving goes away because the value isn't advertised as much in my view yeah Yeah. well and it's interesting too because you you know thinking of kobe and the the obsession for the game right yeah this is not such a good word yeah this is not to say that that they're not you know guys that are obsessed with the game now but it's it's like your point about talking about Michael Jordan, right? You know, the passion that's on the court, right? If as a leader, you know, for the Wizards, if you're playing and realize that there are people that are playing at this level of talent, at this level of, you know, the NBA that don't have that crazy obsession, right? Like there's still a big separation between what people care about, even at that level of, of you know, sport and athletics and you know fame even celebrity what all the stuff that comes with it right like people just you know some people are probably driven to you know i don't this sounds bad but like get the fit off in the tunnel right like that's equally as important to a lot of people as putting up yes you know they've been able to get into that world a little bit over the past few years and that's from every level of player, it's a totally thought about thing. Uh, it's interesting. You've touched on the mic thing. Uh, I'm going to make a slight joke out of it. Uh, just because I critiqued him as of, you know, being a 40 and 41 year old and coming back and playing for them. But I want to state like how special that is. And I think it leads into this full conversation because like I'm 37 a few weeks ago, like I, I run about, I run five times a week do about anywhere on the low end, depending on my schedule of three and a half miles and on the high end, eight miles. It usually ends up right around between four and five though. That's where I'm at. Just got done on Sunday afternoon, ran like four and a half miles. I come back, Gavin's outside playing basketball. So I join him. I couldn't do shit. Like I felt miserable. My legs were falling apart. Like my knees are done. Like I could barely make a jump shot, like anything. And I was like, how like the real feat of Michael Jordan those two years on the Wizards was the fact that he played 82 games and like did it and still averaged 24 points. So now let's like take the the light humor out of it. We talk about risk a lot. Imagine the risk that probably didn't even factor into him. I don't think it for a moment he went through and was like, this is going to diminish my legacy. And as much as we all like to say it did, the man still averaged 24 points. Go and look like at today's standard averages. Most of those guys are doing like 25 to 26 points, right? Yep. Even as like the youth of the world taking over. But my point is, is like he's critiqued on this hard level. That level of risk he did because he felt that that's what was right. That was what was right for his duty at that time for the game of basketball and what he needed to do. We need that. Like that's what's needed in the product world. And it's part of this is because it's become so big. I, I mean, it's, it's almost uncontrollable. You can't. Yeah. But I also think that that's why you're seeing the success of many other small startups and many other little pieces that are coming in more so than ever because it's easier to get if the part of it's easier to get into it from a manufacturing standpoint, but on the other side, it's also, it's capable in the sense that there's enough people that have views and opinions that you can connect with the market to allow them to express those views and opinions. Um, I think the, the great fable of our generation is that we, we are kind of quote unquote, the end of like the S and P 500 generation, right? Where like, Product, product, sales, drive it, make it huge, make it massive, where it's like, all right, generations below us are like, quote unquote, the farm and field, like farm and table, right? Where it's like, it's small. This is what I generate. It's enough for me to be wealthy, be happy. I'm content. Like, I don't need to be rich. Like, this is kind of what it is. It's a, it's a difference in watching that cultural change happen that hasn't happened in footwear and probably can't happen in some of these big brands that we have because it's going backwards. It would kill them. It just, it wouldn't exist. Yep. 
Ab- absolutely agree. And I, and I think that's a, you know, I wanted to get into this anyway, but this, this is, we're at a time where let's, let's say, let's go back to one of my favorite Kings players in recent, well, not even recent years, Tyreek Evans, right? Comes yep. into the league, wins rookie of the year, averages 25 and five, I think one of four players or five players to do that in the history of the league. Now he's playing for my beloved Kings, which means he's going to win about 30 games, maybe 40 if he's really, really lucky and nothing's really going to happen from it. And at that time, you know, this is 2010 ish, whatever. Um, you know, of course you sign a deal with Nike and you get your logo put on the tongue of a hyperdunk or hyperfuse or some variation of a team shoe. And I, at the time, was, like, thinking, like, you know, I mean, it was great because, frankly, you just, as a Kings fan, you just don't get that at all. But, like, you know, Mitch Richmond aside, being, like, the one guy that got cool stuff in Sacramento, um, only because he was the the thorn in Michael's side for a while, right? And I think that's what got him there. But I think that it was it was an interesting time for me to, like, as, like, a fan of footwear thinking, like, man, like I would have rather seen Tyreek do something a little bit different and take a risk to go to a brand that might have given him potentially a signature shoe after that rookie year, or you know, like even just a little bit. They would have taken a little bit more of a risk on him because there's no risk in signing up for a hyperdunk, right? It's a check, right? It's a color that you're going to be able to put on your wall and say, "Hey, this was mine," and. The formula works. We know that the formula works. Now, fast forward, you know, 10 or so years, we're getting to see all sorts of people, to your point, like with the access to, you know, the manufacturing and the access that we just all have collectively to the knowledge that didn't exist on the Internet 10, 15 years ago. It's just a completely different ballgame, right? Like, like there is no reason, you know, this is just my personal opinion. But there's no reason for any NBA player to just say, cool, I'll take that team shoe from Nike that we know doesn't sell and put my, you know, cool logo on it. And I mean cool logo in the best way possible because every logo that Nike has ever done for individual athletes has been phenomenal. Like, I think that's That's something that is totally underrated in like the footwear world is like how well the team at Nike throughout the years has done that we, for people. We did a post on it, Nick. Yeah, we broke yeah. it all down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, but so n- not knowing that you had anything to do with the shoe, we recently went through and did the NBA sneaker uh, signature sneakers. My first pick in kind of our little fantasy mock draft of like this year's shoes was Langston Galloway's Ethics LG1. And it turns out that you were heavily involved yeah. in that. So you, you're you're kind of involved in it. We've never actually talked about it, but like you introduced me to Lang, like at the yeah at, at, at SneakerCon, <laughs> yeah yeah at SneakerCon there. So like I'll never forget him coming up, and you're like, oh, you should talk to him. And so we started chatting, and I didn't like at the time I didn't really know him, know him, and uh, and then he we he reached out. I mean I, you know, he was playing in Detroit at the time. Went to dinner with him a lot, and kind of just kept chilling and doing our thing, and. Yeah, I mean, it, it became the whole thing. So I guess that was what we determined that was 2018. So yeah, I mean, we're like three years in the making. Realistically, we're like two years. We in April of last year, like Senate, we we partnered with like the the manufacturing partner we were going to have, and like that's where it went. It's been an extraordinary event. I mean, we have a lot to come yet. I think things got a little bit uh rushed isn't the word we took advantage of the finals right so that's yeah, kind of how yeah. stuff kind of came out and we put everything out there because you know it's a great time to put it out there that's why it's been a little bit quiet just because it was it was early just to just to flat out state it um but that that journey has been extraordinary you you brought up the hyperdunk stuff you brought up like nike product and other pieces and it it triggered some stuff there's a few things like i've been lucky in my life to work with a lot of athletes and a lot of other things and 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 other people that are uh held on high sneaker ground right 
And uh, when you look at it from that standpoint, what I've learned to find is like how you get information out of them that can drive you to create something original. And for me, it's like, it always starts with conversation. It starts with how you get them to break something down. And Lang, Lang, Langston is really beautiful in that sense. He's obviously probably one of the top five, top three biggest uh, sneakerheads in the league. Um, you know, PJ gets a lot of that credit, but Lang is pretty damn close. Um, but the point to that is, is sometimes that type of, uh, in my view, sometimes that type of person can be kind of damning in what their creativity is because you live off of what you know and what you love. And uh, I kind of came in with a bit of that assumption. But the first time we met, you were in Detroit for a little bit. We met like at a real unsuspected spot. We were at Crispelli's actually. And uh, we were like, he had sketches. Like he had his own, I mean, they not they were good. They weren't Picasso, but they were good. And like, uh, it was enough to communicate what he wanted. And what it really was, was about fit and feel. And then, like, I gave my knowledge of helping other people do what we do of, of kind of create new footwear. And I was like, hey, if I'm, you know, let me just grab the shoe. If I'm you, like, the main thing is don't, don't, like, do anything that's welded. Don't do anything that's molded. At the end of the day, like, tooling is what's going to drive your cost up. But on the flip side, like, we could do some really beautiful things that's cut and sew and nobody else is doing it. Right. That's kind of how we approached it. And a lot of our love for details and footwear stuff was very similar. His favorite basketball shoe of all time is Air Jordan 13, as is mine. Like, so it was just pieces of that did not necessarily come into the shoe, but the communication of all that stuff. And then on the flip side, I don't care how this sounds, as much data we've had and as much, um, information that we have on how to create a shoe michael jordan still won six nba championships pretty much without herringbone and was all in leather suede and other pieces bill russell won 11 in chuck taylor's uh at the end of the day we have not truly proven data wise that a basketball shoe can enable somebody to be better at their sport or their game so with that the focus became like about fit feel and finish and you mentioned concept kicks daniel bailey very good friend of mine one of our quotes is last comes first our major focus was creating a last that really really honed in around the shape to get very modern that's probably the difference that i note in what cut and sew is and what say a knitted shoe or a welded shoe and other pieces can bring to you so it's like how do we get something that's closer to the foot but still makes an aesthetic that's dynamic and i'm not going to say cost effective this is not a cheaply made shoe by any means but it is something that allows us to uh, have a hand quality and handcrafted piece in a time where that doesn't exist. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, it's, it's crazy too, because I mean, you already said it, but I just want to reiterate like the, the passion for footwear that Lang has. Like, I mean, I remember talking to him the first time and just like, even when he was doing the stuff, you know, with Q4 and it was like, mm -hmm. Whoa, like, not only is he, like, one of the nicest people ever, but, like, the conversation was, like, this sound, I, I don't mean this in a bad way, but, like, I've been able to, I've been really lucky to talk to, interview athletes and people in the footwear world for a really long time. And the first conversation I had with him was, like, this guy gets it, like, on a level that most people don't, right? And it has that passion for it on a level that most people don't kind of like what we started this conversation, mm -hmm. you know, with, right. It was like, Oh, okay. This is somebody that's, that will be in that could be in that conversation with us at any given moment. And, you know, marathon conversations and text message chains that last for, you know, years over one, one little question that sparks all of the stuff. Right. And I just think it's, it's cool that the two of you connected because of that. Right. And that's not to dismiss any of the other people that do these types of things in the footwear world. But like when you get around people that have that level of passion and, 
you know, it's just exciting to, 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 to know what possibilities exist when you're around those people that have that and are like looking right. to do something. And obviously, you know, I think that comes through in the, in the shoe, just from the aesthetics and seeing what you guys have done and now getting to talk to you about it. I think from my side, like, uh, this is not to sound arrogant or above anybody else. This is not what I mean by the statement, but just follow me for a moment. The way I view wealth is I view time. And to me, I have a very grueling day job that I take extraordinarily serious and I never take for granted. Uh, and that usually creeps well into my night hours as well. And then I have my family. Uh, I'm obviously a husband and I'm, I'm a father as well of two. And I take that time very seriously. Like, so my point is, is when I kind of take on projects, I highly scrutinize the hell out of them. Like, because it's ultimately taking away from my personal time. And where Lang was beautiful is it was very similar to how I judge anything. Do you have an opinion? Because there's many people, it's really simple, Nick. It's not that hard to get a prototype shoe made. It's not. I mean, it depends how much you want to spend, but let's just say most expensive, it's like 20 grand. Like, and not to say the 20 grand is not a lot of money, but most people that are doing stuff can figure out how to get that if you play loans or other pieces right. But realistically, you probably need like $6,000 to get a prototype made. Going to a production is a completely different conversation because you obviously have to know how you're going to sell it, where you're going to sell it, how much volume you need of each size, which size it's going to be. And working with a lot of these guys and working with him in particular, I mean, he has a view on all of this. He has an understanding of it. And the other thing that I just deeply valued and appreciated working with him was like how much he took advantage of the NBA PA and everything that it offered of him of education wise and going past and beyond. He's naturally somebody that questions something in a healthy and respectful way. He's the way that you do it. As we talked about, you know, 20, 30 minutes ago of somebody coming in and questioning an organization, questioning is good. You don't need to come in there and like be like Chappelle after he won the money on, you know, on Chappelle's <laughs> show and kicks the garbage can and it's like, I'm out. Like you don't need to do that. When you can come in and be like, well, you know, help me to understand this and I'm going to play this. And like, that's Lang to me. His questions are right in the spot. It's been, uh, from a friendship standpoint, it's, it's been absolutely spectacular and phenomenal. Uh, from a product standpoint, we just click and we get it. We have a lot of beautiful, I don't want to get too far ahead of like what it is, but we've got the life cycle laid out for many years to come. I'll state that. And I mean, we're already working on, we didn't, this isn't it. Like there's more. So, and that's, what's been great. We've also been lucky that we have the right partners in manufacturing to help with that as well, too. So it's been great. That's awesome, man. I'm I'm stoked for you guys. Yeah. I mean, I I'm I'm just excited to see you know it all kind of kind of come to come to life, you know, and just see people get their hand, you know, get their feet in them and and wear them because I think to your point earlier, right? And we just had this conversation, you know, the 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 guys on the podcast and I had a conversation recently about some of the stuff that comes out where it, you, you absolutely can't tell what a shoe is if it's in a monochrome coloring on the court. And I, I don't think that you need a crazy branding on a shoe. That's I, I get that. Like the swoosh is beautiful. Like it's, yeah, you know, arguably the like perfect them. logo, right? Like, put it in, anyway. yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But right now, there's so many shoes that are out. You know, maybe with with the most recent Adidas basketball stuff might be a, a slight exception to this, but there's a lot of stuff out that you could interchange the logos from the brands, and nobody would really know which one was actually came from which brand. And part of that, I think, is like there's like this it, it almost feels like <laughs> this sounds terrible, but I'm going to say it because it came to mind. It's almost like the Lululemon thing, right? It's like yeah. this is the, the, the performance aesthetic. So we've made a performance aesthetic shoe. Here's what you 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 know, we'll put your color, your logo, your name, whatever. And we put it on the basketball court. And. I don't know anything about Lululemon, but that's what comes to mind is like, they just made it look like performance apparel. Yeah. Right. 
It's like what yeah. Under Armour did. You look like you, you could know, do twenty years ago, but they, what's that? You look like you could run in this. Like you could do something. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but I, I guess, like, how? What What's the thought process in getting that shoe on foot for the finals? Like, at what point was like that the conversation? Because Obviously, as somebody who is a very casual basketball fan, we're like, I'm going to watch I'm going to watch two games a week on average. But I'm not going to be like diehard. I absolutely always watch the finals every year. Right. Like, that's just, Mm. you know, I'm very respectful of his time and like what he does. He's uh, I mean, it's his obviously it's his profession. Right. Um, On the flip side, he's uh, a veteran in the league. I mean, he's had a long run. Uh, so my point to you is that what's it look like? Uh, I think the way I approached it was trying to handle everything and like get him at the right times of when I truly needed his view and opinion. Um, it, it was a, a journey to say the least. What we were lucky with is the, the smartest thing we did was he sampled, we sampled everything in his size. Uh, nice. you know, yeah. the, the real difference between a startup company and a major company is there's no R and D budget. You don't have time to what you're making, you're making. And so where testing it is, uh, is interesting and how you pull in innovation is a challenge. Uh, with him, we made it in his sample size and he was the one that went right to the court with it. Uh, that started roughly July. That's here. Yeah. Probably July of, of 20. And, uh, and we just started going from there. Um, I think that again, you know, going back to a lot of our conversation in the beginning, like that's where clear communication came into play. I'm not with him. Like even when he's playing in Detroit, I'm not with him. Access wasn't any easier than it is him playing in Phoenix or anywhere else. So you had to learn how to communicate, text, email, whatever it may be, lots of FaceTime videos, adaptability to counter, and knowing how to get the right information. And both of us knew how to communicate really well. I mean, it's just about sharing what it, what, what it needed to be. I think uh, when, when I sit there and think of how it kind of all came together, I mean, it was really, it was really pretty beautiful. I'm very thankful and lucky for the experience of it because it was uh, – it's been fun. You started talking about like graphic and monochromatic. I mean, this was pretty much the colorway that I sketched up from the beginning. So I knew that was going to be one of them. But realistically, knowing that like when you do a new shoe, especially as like a brand new group, even Nike and other bigger companies do it as well. Usually a sole unit lives on past its one lifestyle. So the thing that I focused on as we were doing it was making sure that how we created that sole unit would allow for us to make a different graphic out of shoe two and other pieces like that. So, and I, and I, not to overstate for them or give away too much information as it is, but the reality was, was making sure that we're not just thinking of one at a time and thinking past it. So and that was that was the big piece of a lot of this stuff, and he had the mind for it, and he still has the mind for it. So that's that's where that's been key, and that's not to say that he's different than anybody else or saying that I was surprised by it. It's that you interact with a lot of people that want their own shoe, and that's not just athletes. That's many different people that think they have a view of how they can do something. Very few of them have any thought past what. <laughs> what just their own idea is it's not and that that's what separates success like in my view so yeah yeah that's that's uh that's some that's some great advice i mean honestly like we could we could probably wrap up there but i'm gonna ask you uh one one last question just because so what's what's the most exciting thing in footwear right now to to you outside of the easy you just got in hand the, the the knit runner for the people oh, that are just geez. listening on the podcast. Um, I'll give you this. Um, Nike's running product is really special. I mean, that's, that's really changing the world. I, I, I will say that. Um, other stuff would probably be the Heron Preston stuff that they're doing with, um, Oh, what's Zeller and all of them in 3D printing it. It will yep. be interesting to see how that 
how that changes stuff. Uh, I'm going to dig deep on that in a second. Then Pharrell's, I don't know how to enunciate it, but Pharrell's Rainish shoe is beautiful. Uh, I wish I, I'll buy the blue one probably, but I wish I had the friends and family green one. That's the one I want. I don't care for the burgundy one. Um, I mean, that's a direct injected sole unit onto a knitted upper. I mean, it's pretty beautiful shit. That's like what, if you go back like mid 2000s, some of the better running product was made by Echo and like they did the biome series and that's essentially what that stuff was. I mean, that's bringing a sole unit as close to the foot as possible and the feel of it's got to just be impeccable. So that, that's amazing to me. Adi in general and the way they're handling a lot of stuff is absolutely phenomenal in my view of things. Um, but the Zeller product with Heron Preston and the 3D printed and actually doing that waste, you can manufacture any visual that you want because you don't have to, you know, like I was trying to say, like the draw of this, you know, deep inside this is a stitch. Somehow they're opening this up and stitching that. That is that is not easy to do. Um, it actually made me shocked that this shoe was only $200. And I'm surprised it wasn't more. But anyway, uh, the thing that's surprising me about some of the 3D printed stuff as I'm seeing more stuff come out is it's like they're still kind of making a shoe where it's like they're making like what would be like the midsole line. And it's like... Yeah, we don't have to yeah. do that anymore. Like, it's all one piece. Like, what do you want it to be? You know what I mean? So that's where I see the encouraging. Uh, you know, a lot of people are using Gravity Sketch to do that work, in, which is via Oculus and, 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 you know, 3D software of that. That will change how a shoe is manufactured. That will change how many things are manufactured more than just shoes. But that that excites the hell out of me watching a lot of that type of stuff just come to life and 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 seeing it needs a level of refinement though like you can see where some of that stuff is still um i mean this lovingly to any student that's listening to it but it looks like a student project uh which is good it brings excitement to it but it's missing that like final 10 to 15 percent that you just get through experience of doing stuff uh but that those are probably the things that excite me nick do you think right do now. you think the the you know, the, the 3D printing thing to me is always the exciting piece. You know, I guess it's kind of like the car thing, right? Like it, it ties into my car, the, my love of car stuff anyway, because we all have cars that have, you know, even if you, if if you're into cars and, and have had an older car that had any little thing break, that's basically irreplaceable at this point. Cause nobody's going to yeah. make old stuff. 3D printing is like, it's feasible to just go get something replaced that you could never have replaced up until the last say five years, realistically, probably like two or three years at a, at a reasonable price. But like, you know, five years ago, it was like, Oh my God, I can replace this Honda CRX dash piece that is notorious for breaking for a few hundred bucks. Now you can probably get it for, I mean, hell you could buy a printer and print it yourself for under 300 bucks. Probably. I mean, um, yeah. do you think that we'll get, you know, this is, I guess, more philosophical, but like the, the lack of waste to me is, is the, the, like the giant, you know, green light of go down this path, right? It's like, if we can figure out how to incorporate these things, like you said, in a way that is aesthetically appealing Beyond just like, I think like, it, I, I think you mentioned it looking like a shoe and I, I, that's something that I always find fascinating where it's like, you don't have to make it look the same as we have, as we know Perfect. shoes, which to, to, you know, I, I'm not like a, a huge Kanye fan. I'm a fan that of the things that you talk about him doing, right? Like it's what his brand stands for is something that's, it's, you know, not to be cheesy about the name, but it's outside the box, right? Like it is not mm. the status quo. Well, I think what you're leading to, it's hard to decipher Kanye for just because Kanye comes in. Yeah. Kanye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but do you think that the, the ultimate drive towards, you know, 3d printing and incorporating that into, you know, obviously for somebody like Nike, that's going to make hundreds of thousands of a pair of, 
you know, monarchs or something that's not feasible to, to print in that capacity yet. But I think from a market on the marketing side, is it going to be like, Hey, this is better for the environment on top of the fact that this is just really cool shit and innovative. Yeah. I mean, the environment piece remains to be seen. I guess if we get to a point where it's all biodegradable right now, it has to yeah. be ground up and put back into a polymer. Yeah. So that that's not something you or I can do, you know, if we have our own 3d printer. Um, I, I think the way there's, there's a few things ultimately it's going to come down to cost and time cost is obviously there, but the time isn't there yet. So like right now to do a pair, I just know from what we kicked off on another project of doing a 3d printed shoe on my own. I mean, it's like you're looking somewhere between 12 and 33 hours of printing for a pair, uh, compared to, you know, that's, I can say it this way, but that's probably like 3,000 pairs of shoes in the standard way of doing it, right? Yeah. So there's that time and dedication. I think the other piece is, is like, let's go back to the most revolutionary piece of footwear that probably happened was Flynet or PrimeNet, depending on what side of the world you fall on. So 2012, right? And that aesthetic took over everything. And that you know, people got tired of that aesthetic. It's now arguably the cheap aesthetic now, like the way it looks, right? So um, but I guess my point that I try to make with it is ultimately footwear consumers, uh, regardless to what age, what demographic you fall in, it's all aesthetic driven. So 3D printing uh, will obviously have a huge impact. Uh, but at some point, that aesthetic will not be the desired aesthetic. I think as we talk about sustainability and other pieces like that, all areas of manufacturing comes into play. But the real question should be is determining, does this damn product need to be made? And if you're going to make it, how are you going to do it in the best way possible? Uh, you know, just low hanging fruit. I think the latest curry has like 18 colorways. Like, do we, you know, we, we grew up with the Jordan 11. That's the most, Harold basketball shoe ever black white black and red like the, the point that i'm trying to make with that is like the impact is there if you do it properly now it's to a point where that level of colorways under armor didn't do anything wrong it's what's expected of them uh yeah but my statement to you with all this stuff is it's just questioning in the right way and determining what's needed and what's not needed how are you going to do it? Do I think 3D printing becomes the dominant piece? Probably not. I could see it becoming the component. I mean, if we were to re re-engineer a flight posit, why wouldn't you just 3D print that entire chassis and then stitch the booty in, right? Or yeah. uh, like the the Zavojka, like that entire silicone piece could be 3D printed now. Um, the heel counter on a Hyperdunk. Boom, 3D print, put it in there. I think it becomes elements like that, in my opinion, at some point. I do think you will see a... I mean, Nike's already done it with their running one that they did that was right around the time of the... Uh, I don't remember what they called it, but it can be done. But it's time, energy, and effort. I think the real story is how you utilize it to enable the athlete and enable the person that's wearing it. Uh, in theory, all of us have the software or can have the software on our phone to turn our phone into a 3D scanner. I mean, think about it as everything goes online, 3D scan that thing and like send it to have the shoe made around you. Like that, that's where it becomes key because no matter what, all of us have a different foot and we're all forcing it into one standard way of it being made. So yeah, that's kind of definitely. what I see things changing. Okay, so so that means I have one more question for you because uh, that's fine. <laughs> the uh, the Virgil Jordan Two, right? The kind of <laughs> the big selling point is, at least from my understanding, from him commenting it, right? on stuff, is that it was an original Jordan Two that Michael had that was re three D scanned, right? Yeah. And like. We pulled it out of the pyramids. It's King Tut's shoe, and we went and scanned it so we can put it in the, the Metropolitan Museum of Art and have a whole thesis on why it's decaying the way it is. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 so I, I feel the same way, right? I feel like, okay, I get that this is like the story, the selling point, but it's everything, right? Like you wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily want a shoe that looks like it's crumbled to wear. Like if I had an original Jordan two made in Italy and I wanted to, and that was my favorite shoe and I mm-hmm. wanted to have it on the wall and display mm-hmm. it, then I get it. But yeah. like, I don't like, I guess like that's, that's like one of the things that I'm wondering is like to, to the 3d scanning conversation, right? Like that's what you chose to 3d scan and recreate. And then like, are you, are you, is this now going to inspire the, the, you know, the customizers that put their own logo in, in place of the swoosh on a Jordan one to, to like download that software, 3d scan a shoe and them Jordan one souls. God, that would make me yeah. happy. Here's what I take from it, Nick. Like I, I, a lot of them follow me and they're good people and I should probably be more in line with some of it, but most of the, the, the Instagram chain that Virgil was responding on, like, I'll be real. It's a bunch of people that have fallen so in love with Michael Jordan that they want every piece that's directly tied to who he is. This is nothing different than Upper Deck releasing Michael Jordan's jersey in a fucking sports card. Like, that's all this really is. This isn't footwear innovation. That's not what any of it is. Um, my, my personal opinion with it, and I wrote on that chain and didn't get any response from Virgil, but I got it from others. Like, well, you guys are just living off of nostalgia. Like, if that's what you want, like, if you want to recapture nostalgia and keep selling it to the 45-year-olds that wish Michael Jordan that was still playing basketball and repost, you know, Michael dunking on in twos on Tuesday and MJ Mondays and, like, all this other stuff, but as opposed to embracing the new group because we all want to think of 1996 and we're still 70 two and 10, but it's like, I struggle with that stuff. Like I can let that, that past die. Like I, I, it was very important. It meant the world to me. It still makes me feel good, but we keep going back to the same stuff to create something new. We're not creating anything new. That's not new. I'll critique Virgil on this sense. I think the man's a vision. If I think his most important piece is probably how he's enabled other people to become creative, I think he would probably, in my opinion, I think he's more of a curator than he is like a true vision. But that's important and that's really good and that's what he's done. I think that Nike has probably kept him in a box where his aesthetic is the same thing every time because it's what is expected it to be. Uh, like when they first did the collection of the 10, I heralded that shit. Like I thought it was incredible. Like, because yeah. he basically took the internals of a shoe and how it was made and displayed it, which is very much what, you know, the architecture that he was in love with and studied and stuff. I think that's important. We haven't grown from there though. In four years, we haven't grown from any of that. We're still doing the same thing. And now, you know, we're going back and retelling a story to the kids of today. And it's like, well, why do the kids need to know? of a mediocre shoe in the Jordan line from 1987 that I hate to break it to people. We all like it and have like the nerdy side of it, but it didn't sell well and it didn't do well. And I think if we were to get Michael's real critique of it, he about left the company because of it. So it's (laughs) not like that. That, that piece probably isn't that important to tell the children and like let the youth grow on and let the kids see for today. So to have it scanned and then have Michael rewrite his name, you know, 40 times and we picked the best variation of it and put it on there, like, come on, man. This is like the same shit that we were buying of upper deck basketball cards when we were younger. This isn't footwear. Like, this isn't what it's supposed to be. Name it what it is. It is that piece for you to put in your collection. It is not meant to be worn. It's nothing more than that. And I, you know, if I get some hot takes out of that and for being rude or damning, it's, it's not that, but it's not like we're not changing the world with that shoe. And in my opinion, he has the opportunity to change the world with his presence and his power and what it is. And that's what was chose to be done. Is it an anomaly in the Jordan line? Absolutely. No doubt. But I don't know. I don't, I don't have any value for it in that sense, Nick, but everything's subjective art subjective. So, you know, 
yeah, definitely, man. And, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's interesting too, for me personally, just because, you know, obviously sneaker history being like all nostalgia for the most part. Mm. Right. And that's yeah. part of why I enjoy talking to you and, and, you know, like even me personally, like I have, I have like, I don't want to say second, you know, like I'm not like second guessing what I do. Cause like really it's just, this is just a side project for me to talk to my friends about sneakers all the time. But <laughs> the name itself is I, I, like, I'm at the point of questioning, like, man, maybe we should change it to something different just because I don't want it to always be repeating the same old, same old, right? Like, don't get me wrong. Some of that stuff is fun. And like, now that I have nephews that are coming up to that age of starting to play basketball regularly, it's like, okay, cool. I get to talk to them and share that, share some of these things with them. So it's, it's, at, it's, it's a weird thing for me because it's like the nostalgia is important to me, but at the same time, I'm kind of bored with it the same way I am all the dunks, even all the Reebok questions. Like it's not just Nike. This is like, you know, the same kind of stuff that we were talking about earlier where it's like just everybody kind of looked at Nike and was like, well, that's the formula. Let's try to do the formula there. And, sure. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you said too, because I, I, I think Virgil is, is like incredibly creative, but I see it from like the, I've worked in a business like this before, and it's now just rehashing the same formula, which is so frustrating. Cause like, if somebody can push right. that different you vision, it is him. It's like, people are like, they're going to bow down to him because he's the one that's moved the needle so much in the last four years. I don't think anybody else has maybe say, other yes. than Kanye, maybe. Yeah. Well, and financially, he doesn't have to say yes. So then you yeah. have to wonder if it's just like a licensing deal and regardless of his input or not, they're going to do something because realistically the formula that they're doing, they don't need to involve him. They need him to sign off on it. Uh, but you know, you, you, you critiquing the name and everything like that. If I didn't know, I mean, no, I don't think you need to change the name. You didn't ask me that, but just give me my own opinion on it because it's like, to me, if I didn't know the history as deep as I would, I didn't know how to create the future or have an opinion on what the future should be, I should say. So history is definitely important. Uh, the reality is, is that people need to be willing to use history to create their future and not necessarily just sit there and recreate and recreate and recreate. They need to be able to challenge what they need and what they should do. And that's how you use it in the brightest way. That's the reason why we learned about history in school in general is to understand what you need to do for the future. Uh, I think the worry that I have is that we just have a bunch of shoes right now. We don't have any real product. And that's, uh, it's grown too big. It, it's, uh, it, as we talk about sustainability, it's downsizing. That's the real answer and getting it to the right amount of product that we need it to be. That's, yeah. that's, that's how I look at it. And hopefully people can utilize your podcast and learn about that history to know these were the ones that stuck. What am I doing now? Because I can tell you right now, doing another Jordan one colorway isn't going to be the one that's it. Like if anything, it's so cluttered, you won't remember what the, what they are, you know? Yeah, hundred percent agree. Actually, uh, uh, I don't know if you've listened to uh, Business Wars, but I do not. Yeah, they, there's a there's a podcast called Business Wars. I can't remember the name of the host, but he's a it's a pretty well funded, famous kind of you know documentary organization behind it. Uh, but they they're actually, and if you're listening to this podcast and you suck it out to the end, like it's worth listening. It's a uh, it's Basically, I think they recently started one on fast fashion and the kind of the downsides to that, the way that the brands have, you know, and this is, you know, brands like H&M and Forever 21 right. and stuff like that, where they're churning out hundreds of thousands of pieces every month for, you know, where the excess, they have so much excess product that they're literally incinerating it because they just can't get rid of it. And you know, obviously a conversation for another time, but, uh, worth listening to 
if you're listening to this and you know you want to learn a little bit more about how, how just crazy the world of mass production and overproduction is um, yeah. yeah but it's sad it's yeah. it's uh it's yeah i don't know what the right answer is it's sad but they're in a spot where they don't know how to stop uh, yep yep well man uh i really appreciate you spending a couple hours with me and chatting this has been awesome as it always is i i you know honestly like we we just need to do this on a much more regular basis as opposed to yeah, the yeah, every six to nine months so it feels um, really good in my heart like it feels like i get a lot off my chest yeah no it's good yeah. like, i'm down I'll yeah do it. yeah and uh, so oh, no. definitely I mean, we'll let right. everybody know where they can find you too. So they can find you, uh, you know, on, on social and stuff. Yeah, just hit me up on Instagram. You can find me at Golif, but outside of that, like I, I kind of work my way through some stuff every once in a while, but just hit me up on Instagram at Golif. Or if you really want to talk to me, just email me at bgolif at Gmail. Any of it. Yeah. It's fun. Cool, man. Yeah. Thanks everybody for listening, tuning in, watching wherever you're taking this in. Uh, make sure you connect with Brett and we'll catch you on the next episode. Peace. Yes. Later. Hey everyone. This is Nick again. Before you take off, I wanted to thank you for listening to the sneaker history podcast. We just launched our new merch, including tees, stickers, keychains, and a bunch of other pieces you can grab to show your support for the podcast. You can purchase it now through our companion site, sittingtreasure.com. You can also get access to more episodes of the podcast by joining our Discord community at patreon.com slash sneaker history. Plus, we've got a bunch of other fun things going on in the community, including trivia nights, giveaways, access to sneaker raffles from around the world, release announcements, and my favorite, just good people helping good people get the sneakers they want. Plus, we're not bought by advertisers, investors, or other big money. I'm confident in saying this is the best sneaker community I've ever been a part of. We've also teamed up with a few partners to offer our supporters discounts. You can find some in the links for this episode and even more in our Discord. Give us a try, and if you don't enjoy it, you can always cancel the membership at any time. Last but not least, tell someone you like their kicks today. You never know how far a simple compliment can take you, and we all know how good it feels to be on the receiving end of someone showing appreciation. Thank you all for the support, and we'll catch you on the next episode. Peace. Hey everyone, this is Nick again. Before you take off, do us a solid and head over to Apple Podcasts to leave us a review. Give us a rating on Spotify and Amazon Music, and make sure you're subscribed to our YouTube channel because we have even more video content coming soon. Speaking of new content, we have an amazing community of sneaker enthusiasts that hang out in our Sneaker History Discord on a daily basis. While sneakers is a connection point that brought us all together, we've all discovered countless shared passions that we have in common with each other. We recently launched a couple of new podcasts directly from our community. One of them is a Formula One podcast. If you're an F1 fan like me, the Exhaust Notes podcast is your weekly fix of Formula One fun. It's hosted by myself, Rohit Malhotra, and Todd Yates. New episodes drop every Tuesday. I've been wearing fitted hats for years and collecting my favorite teams since I was a little leaguer. It has been awesome to see so many new fans getting into fitteds in recent years. Crown & Stitch is our new talk show about fitted hats with Dexter, Keith, and myself, where we talk about fitted hats, snapbacks, throw in some obscure hats because we all kind of like some funky stuff once in a while, don't we? Copping, collecting, and so much more. New episodes drop every Wednesday. Hit the links in the show notes for this episode to give our new shows a listen and be on the lookout for more new podcasts dropping soon. Last but not least, tell someone you like their kicks today. You never know how far a simple compliment can take you, and we all know how good it feels to have someone show their appreciation. Thank you all for the support, and we'll catch you on the next episode. Peace.